All right. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. This is David Patrick Harry with Church of the Eternal Logos, and I have a very frequent returning and very special guest, the author Rachel Wilson. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing fantastic, Patrick. I'm so happy to be back. You know, your show is one of my favorite to do. We always have a good time. So, yes, we always have a great time. And, uh, you know, the topic at hand tonight, I came across a video talking, referring to this Morgan Stanley article, which we'll dive into about uh, projecting the U.S. economy in that by 2030, they expect 45 percent of women to be single and childless by the year 2030. And this was sort of parroted as a a wonderful thing for the U.S. economy because women, particularly then single women, spend the most and uh, contribute the most to the U.S. economy. But yes. before we even dive into that, I wanted to give a very special shout out to your godson. Um, you, would you like to share with everybody the, the very special news? Yeah, actually. So um, you guys might know Zen Shapiro is the new co-host of The Crucible, and he and his wife were baptized this weekend. They actually have different sponsors, but Andrew and I are the godparents to their daughter, Francesca. So we got to attend the baptism and it was a fabulous weekend. We had a great time and glory to God for that. So big shout out to Zen Shapiro and his fabulous little family. Yes. Shout out to Zen Shapiro. God bless you, brother. Many years to you and yours, your wife and your your beautiful child. So uh, yeah, just wanted to give him a quick shout out. Um, I know he's also a friend of the program over here. So just wanted to congratulate him on the step and uh coming home. Welcome to the church, brother. So now with that being said, now we can dive into uh, the topic at hand tonight, which is uh, not specifically about crazy cat ladies, but I think the natural progression of our conversation is going to lead into the crazy cat lady, because in a way she is the end product of what we're getting ready to discuss. And so um, any opening remarks you want to start with before we maybe dive into the Morgan Stanley article to provide a foundation for our conversation? Yeah, so the just the the statistic, 45% of women between the ages of 25 and 44 being single and childless has to be a first in human history. Right. Um, if you have ever done any digging into this kind of topic, um, it, each of us has twice as many female ancestors as we do male ancestors throughout all of human history. It has generally been women who have passed on genetics the most often. It's been the easiest for us to find mates. We're kind of the gatekeepers and the choosers and the men have to compete for our affections and for the chance to pass on their genetics. And now suddenly a mere century, which is a tiny, a tiny, teeny millisecond in the grand scheme of human time. Um, In the span of one century of feminism, we are looking at almost half of childbearing age women being single and childless and instead being, you know, their master rather than a man is going to be, you know, their corporate master instead um, or, you know, the government or both, however you want to look at it. And I'm sure we'll get into all that, but it's it's a mind blowing change. And I don't think the impact of it can be understated. This is going to be a big deal for the next few generations. And this is only seven years away. Right. That they're predicting that this will be the case. So, and, and we're already seeing, it, and that was what's surprising from the article is that it's not this radical jump. In 2019, they, there was an article based on the study in 2018, and it was already 41% of women. Yes. And so you extrapolate further, you know, by the time we move into the later 2030s, it will be half of all American women will be single and childless and will be devoted to some type of job or career and will live alone. Or as what's also uh, I've seen being promoted online as a sort of sisterhood is that these women who find themselves uh, post-menopause um, and single, and maybe average or above average income, um, having to essentially live with other women who are in the same position, because um, especially if they make just an average income, say, I, I again, one of the articles and sources that you shared showed the 
average income of a single woman was like 41,000. So nothing too high. And so to re you can't retire off of that. And so by the time they get into their 60s and 70s, they by necessity, they'll have to live with another woman um, just to live so that they can both contribute their 40 some thousand dollars or whatever it is to trying to live together. And if they are retired, if they're living off Social Security, which I suspect Social Security won't even exist in the future, uh, they're going to be really, really hurting. And, and, and in a way, this whole process moves us back to this traditional structure where there was no welfare system. You depended on your family, your husband, your kids, your extended family. And in, right. as we look forward into the future and the Great Reset or what's going on, that's also going to be who's going to support us. It's going to be your husband. It's going to be your children. It's going to be your grandchildren. It's going to be the extension of your family. And so these women are really throwing all their eggs, pun intended, in the basket of the of the federal welfare system or some sort of federal structure that's going to be able to continue where we see the economy, the you know, the pandemic in 2020, things are going to occur that these women are not prepared to deal with without another partner. And, and men and women naturally need to be together. Yeah, absolutely. And there's so much to say about this, but I think maybe a good place to start is to kind of take a look at how we got here. Yeah. And then we can talk about all of the implications. I've got stats coming out my ears for you guys on this one. Um, so if you, any of you who have read my book um, probably have gotten to the last chapter where I kind of examine, okay, we've had a hundred years of feminism now. Um, how's that gone for us? Like how well has that done? And the, the most recent article on my sub stack is basically like a, a excerpt from that chapter. And I just titled it, how's that feminism thing working out? <laughs> <laughs> turns out not so good. Yeah, um, turns out. Yeah. And if you take a look at, you would think after a century of progress for women, right? Um, this is all based on a premise that we should mention, which is that all, you know, the, the popular notion is that life for women up until 1920, when they officially got the vote and became liberated, was terrible, horrible slavery. And men were horrible and they beat us and they chained us to the stove in the kitchen and they forced us to have babies. And uh, we, we had no uh, agency and we had no choice and it was just terrible, right? Like that's the conception that's been put out there through all the propaganda of the last century to convince women and push them in this direction. So I thought, well, okay, let's take a look and see what women have done with this whole century of strong independent womanhood. Let's see what they decided to do. If you take a look at the top 10 careers from the Department of Labor mm -hmm. um, and the US Census from 1920 to 2020, the top 10 careers, I'm just going to read them out for you guys real quick, because I think you might be a little surprised. So yeah. in 1920, these were the top 10 occupations held by women in the United States. They were domestic or personal service, teacher, typewriter or clerical, clerks, farm labor, laundry or laundress, uh, saleswoman, bookkeeping or cashier, cook, and then general farmer. If we take a look at 2020, the top 10 <laughs> occupations held by women in the United States are teacher, nurse, health aide, secretary or clerical, cashier, customer service rep, retail, retail managers, waitress, and general managers. So really all that's changed in 100 years is that we swapped out farm labor for like retail jobs. Yeah. Other than that, women are doing the same things they've always done, taking care of the young, teaching them, taking care of the sick and the elderly, right. um, doing administrative support, clerical typing type of things, and then domestic things like laundry, housework, housekeeping, and bookkeeping. The only difference now is that rather than doing those things for your family, for your family business, maybe you did those things for your father's business, your husband's business, you're doing them for an international corporation who sees you as a barcode. Right. You are nothing to them, right? So it's this meme I like to share once in a while of the strong, independent woman telling her husband to make his own sandwich because she has to go to work. And then she goes to work and she's at a subway asking the person what they want on their sandwich. Um, so I think that's a really important thing to stress because right. when you when you talk about career women, women always imagine 
And you would never talk to a girl in college and ask her what she sees herself doing. And she's going to say, oh, I'm going to be a home health aide, which is basically like you go in and clean up bedpans and you change sheets and you uh, give medication and things like that. Or you're, you're a retail manager or you're a waitress, right? They always think because we sell them the dream through propaganda that they're going to be a boss. Right. They're going to have that corner office. They're going to be having fancy business lunches. They're going to be traveling to exotic places to close a business deal. You know, they're going right. to be buying the new Gucci shoes. Uh, they're going to get the latest, you know, Birkin bag or whatever it is. And they're going to be strong and independent. And they won't need anybody. And then I can pick a man that I want, not a man that I need. Well, the reality a hundred years later is that that's not what women have chosen to do. Right. They're not on average, choosing to be bosses or run companies. Yes, there are some, and there are more than there used to be. But for the average woman, that's not what happens. So I think the first lie in many layers of lies to this story is the idea that every girl is going to grow up to be a boss. Right. I mean, men know that's not true. Men know, <laughs> even when they're little boys, okay, we're not all going to be president. We're not all going to be astronauts. We're not right. all going to be the boss. By the time boys get to fifth grade, they know that. But women, they go off to college thinking they're all going to be Beyonce right. or they're all going to be Hillary Clinton or something. And the reality is most of them are going to be waitresses or working in a retail store or doing some kind of like home health care or, you know, preschool teaching or something like that. Right. There's nothing wrong with that, but it's hardly worth trading a family for. So maybe. Yeah. Well, maybe in, in regards to that, too, that sort of com competition between men is why then boys at a young age knows not everybody's going to win. Not everybody's going to be the best basketball player, or the best football player. And so within boys and masculinity, there's always this stress on competition so that we naturally sort ourselves out. Women to some degree of competition, but again, not the same type of competition. Their competition is really a sexual marketplace type of competition, but because they're leaving that competition in its traditional form, um, they now think, oh, I'll go to university, I'll get my degree, and then I'll be given this position, right? It's not a competition for it. It's, well, right. I got my grades. I mean, I graduated from yeah. the college. I get I get the job, right? Uh, no. And that I think this is perfect for the cat, the crazy cat lady, which again we'll get we'll dive a little bit deeper into later. But the cat lady is somebody who typically has a home. Typically, maybe it's an apartment or a home or something, a small little place to live. Um, they probably have a job. They probably have some type of steady income. But they're single, they're childless, and they're lonely. And so you talked about the nurturing attributes of traditional femininity, but there's nobody to care for. And, and even cats themselves, I thought it's so ironic that cats take less need than dogs. Dogs are a much more of a companion animal. Uh, cats, and I'm not trying to disparage cats in any way, people who like cats. Uh, cats are great, but cats also, they don't naturally have that same affinity towards connection and relationships that a dog would. And dogs typically demand then more attention. And so the narcissism of the, the sole focus of one's own pleasure, I think the cat is the perfect analogy for the woman who's diving deeper and deeper and deeper into her sort of her own preferences, where the, the opposite of the cat lady is the homeless man with the dog. Because yeah. the homeless man with the dog has decided to not compete anymore, whether it be drug addiction, whether it be a divorce that, that you know, undercut his entire life savings, whatever it may be. Um, the homeless man has gave up on the masculine uh, impairment to compete, to make money, to provide, to contribute to society. And that's why then he's homeless, but he has the companion and the dog. And the woman, the crazy cat lady, has the job, but there's nobody to nurture. And so the homeless man doesn't compete. And then the crazy cat lady doesn't nurture. And right. in a way, that's why then I thought it's so funny. And I used for the thumbnail, the crazy cat lady from the Simpsons in the Simpsons, the homeless man with the dog and the crazy cat lady fall in love. And I think, oh, that's my gosh, the perfect I forgot analogy. all about that. I forgot all about that. But that's true. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, so when you think about this, right, like I said, all these girls going off to college um, and, and I remember because in my friend group, um, we were all smart girls and we were all in like advanced classes and we were, it was like expected we were all going to go to college, right? We were, it was just like from day one when we were in first grade, it was like, 
just which college are you going to and which career are you choosing? No other option was ever even presented, especially because it was like, well, you're smart. So you have this obligation to like be an example for other women and not go this uh, lousy homemaker route because that's for losers who who can't go to college or who can't hack it in the workplace. And you've got to do this. Um, and and my little group of girlfriends, there was four of us. We went all the way through school together. And um, I was the only one that by the end of high school didn't want to go to college. Um, A lot of it was because I was just so fed up with how fake I thought school was, to be perfectly honest. Because, I mean, there were multiple points throughout school that it became clear to me it was not about what I had learned or what I knew or things like that. It was about my ability to show up every day and get perfect attendance and, you know, get all the little gold stars and things like that. So even if, if I had a teacher who... I corrected or something, I would get in trouble even if I was right. Things like that. Um, And I just, the thought of four more years of school, but having to pay for it, I was like, nah. And I really did want to get married and have kids. Like, I thought that seemed like a really cool thing to do. I wanted a family, like, as long as I can remember. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was like I broke people's hearts And like, I just crushed their hopes and dreams when I didn't go to college and all those friends of mine went off to college. And anytime we would get back together, they would say comments like, oh, it's such a shame that you never did anything with your life because you were so smart and you had such potential and, you know, or you were so talented at all these different things. And it's just such a shame, you know, Um, and that made me feel terrible. And I thought, well, I don't think my life is a waste and I don't think it's a shame, but But every so often when life gets hard, as it does for all of us, I would think to myself, are they right? Did I screw up? Should I have chosen differently? And that's a big reason why um, I talk about this stuff, because women, we don't talk about this. We don't talk about the fact that we do this to each other or that this is the propaganda that's put out there, that it's like you're kind of a loser if you don't go to college and get a degree and have a career. Mm -hmm. Um, And since I've started talking about these things and my book has come out, I've gotten dozens of emails, DMs, even letters in the mail, um, you know, from people who've requested like to buy the book from me. And then they end up sending me a letter um, from women who have said, I'm trapped and I'm stuck. Um, I went to college. I've got all this debt. I'm, I'm a dentist now. I'm a doctor now. I've got, you know, a practice And I just had my first baby and all I want to do is stay home. What do I do? And they're trapped. And they're like, my parents will never forgive me if I quit my dental practice or if I drop out of my senior year in college before I get my master's and, and I've already got all the debt and, you know, they're, they're stuck and they're trapped and they, they feel like I'm the only person they can talk to about it. And I'm a total stranger, just a lady who wrote a book because these are the expectations we've set. And girls like to, we like approval. Girls like approval. We like everyone to pat us on the head and tell us we did a good job and that we're good. Right. Generally, most of us are that way, especially ones who are high achieving. So they don't feel like they can even talk about the fact that they don't want to do this anymore. They don't want to have a, you know, million dollar a year practice or like be a lawyer, you know, with a 70 hour work week. Uh, So it's, it's pretty bad when we're in a point where these highly competent, really intelligent, very successful women are writing me letters to say they feel trapped and don't know how to get out. So um, there are some who feel that way. And then there are others who are extremely narcissistic and have gone the other direction and really think that you know, they'll look at somebody like me and just think, oh, well, you're, you're just saying these things because you're a loser and you couldn't hack it. You're not as you don't have all the things I have and you're envious or something like that. And those women look at all the men, right, because they don't want a man, a man who earns less and they don't want a man who they perceive as lower status. But they also want the man who's going to be good to them and treat them right and be virtuous and all that stuff. Well, that's not what you get. Right. When you're, if you're a, um, a, a lawyer making 150,000 a year as a woman and you are really successful, let's say you've gotten to that top, top rung of the ladder, you're going to have a really hard time 
finding a partner. It's yeah. going to be tough because you're going to want guys who are super high status. And those guys are going to want women who want to give them babies and stay home with their babies for the most part. Right. There's always exceptions. There's always outliers. But for the most part, really high status men want younger women of childbearing age who want to have their kids because those men want progeny. Right. It's and so you end up with this total mismatch all the way through. And that's what we're seeing right now. And the birth rate reflects it. The birth rate is abysmally low. Yeah. And I don't know what we're going to do about that either. Well, you hit on the, you know, the dimension of hypergamy in regards to dating. And um, I, you know, in some of the manosphere, you know, this is considered such a detriment, you know, oh, hypergamy. But again, if you have a daughter, I mean, who I want her to marry, I want her to be with a better well-off man who again embodies the values and traditions that i hold but i don't think hypergamy is so much the problem as you talked about the sort of uh, conceptions of success and the impetus of these women to become these high-paying sort of career women and the skewing of what the sexual marketplace and like what a man would be looking for um one of the things that i wanted to, to talk about is that reflecting on this topic is that I, I see career women, especially these women who make, say, so many six-figure salary, and then they are expecting to get that, again, that handsome, traditional man that makes more money that then they can be hypergamous with and they can still marry up, um, that these career women are acting more like gay men in the sexual marketplace. And, I, and what I mean by this is um, looking at the, what is the role of a man in a traditional relationship? And so, uh, everybody has to submit to some sort of authority. And as Christian men, we submit to the authority of the church and God. And then we would, we would expect the woman that we're with to submit to us in some way. Not that you, you know, they ha can't have different opinions. Of course, this isn't, you know, uh, again, that sort of archetype of the brutality of, of the past times, but, there's a succession of submission to some degree. Well, these women, the only thing that they really submit to is the career, is the job, is the corporate state. And I'll tie those together, the state and the corporate. I mean, we, we're sort of moving in that fascistic direction already. So the only thing that these women actually submit to is their boss, is their corporation, and in exchange, they get the money. So they have the sense that they're submitting. They have the sense of responsibility and purpose, and they're also getting compensated well for it. Therefore, what then is the role of the man that they're trying to find? Well, it's for pleasure. It's for sexual yeah. pleasure. It's to be able to take her on her trips. It's to be able to take great Instagram photos together. It's about this sense of pleasure. And so... And that's what I mean by these career women, the way that they approach the, the dating market and men themselves is really in a similar way that gay men approach other gay men. It's not the way yeah. that a woman, a traditional woman would approach a traditional man because they're not offering those things. And so um, men are only there for their pleasure. And then you can see the sort of the, 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 lar the you know, not large, but the loud feminist woman, they're louder, more opinionated maybe flamboyant, yep. and then, of course, more promiscuous. All these characteristics that we would associate with gay men, we see these careerist feminist women also embodying these same characteristics. And so then it's like the drag queen is the is the point of these two kissing cousins, the, the career woman, feminist, and then the gay man. The drag queen is the point in which these things come together at a sort of societal archetype. And we're seeing that now in the normalization of that because the drag queen isn't a woman. It, it's not, you know, it's like a gay man. It, it's a hybrid of all these different things. It's about making money and it's about sexuality and it's about promiscuity and it's about loudness and flamboyancy. And so the more I thought about it, it's like career women in regards to the sexual uh, marketplace are more like gay men than they are like reg other women. That is so true. And so the second book that I'm working on right now, um, it, I didn't want to do another book right away, but I had to because um, in Russia, in the communist era, like with the Bolsheviks, this, it was the same people behind it. It was the same transnational elites behind feminism in the liberal West and in the communist East, but they knew that they needed like different strategies for different populations to make it fly. Right. So 
among the early Bolshevik government, they had something called the Zinatel, which was like the women's department of the government, which was a new thing. Um, and this was part of what communism was supposed to be. And the propaganda there, they had a bunch of women in charge. It was Lenin's wife, his mistress, mm. and then a, another a very popular and charismatic diplomat called Alexandra Kolontai. And they put together a brilliant propaganda campaign encouraging women to stop looking at themselves as mothers and wives and to instead start looking at themselves as economic labor units. <laughs> and if that isn't what we have ended up with, oh, that's a, that, I, mean, I don't that know is what today's is. topic, right? That is the Morgan Stanley article. Yes. And this was the vision they had for the future in like 1917, 1918 and all of their writings and their pamphlets. And, um, one of them even started writing like fan fiction stuff because they realized women aren't super into political tracts and things like that. So they started trying to write fictional stories that would work as propaganda because that's a very common thing. I mean, we do that with Hollywood. We do it with movies. And at that time, it was more books, right? So she wrote a book called the, I think it's called The Love of Three Ages. And it's a horrific, terrible story about a woman who... Um, you know, th at this time, we had the idea of the new woman, right? The new liberated woman. And in the West, it was about the flapper girl and partying and uh, getting to have your own money and your own job and go to college and that sort of thing. And in the East, it was more of like a hippie communist kind of take where it was like, and we had free love and all that stuff here. But for them, it was like all under a very communist flag. So it was like free love. But because we're, you know, we have different people we love for different reasons. And maybe you have a man that you love for intellectual reasons. And then you have a man you love for sexual reasons. And then you have a man you love as your brother. And so why have one man in your life when you might have several men that fill all these different roles? And, and this is going to prepare people for mm. communism and for living in communes because they had to break up the family unit. The right. family unit is the way that men would pass down their legacy and their property. Right. right? And their tradition. But if you want communism, you've got to break up the family and get rid of legitimate marriage, of uh, contracts between husbands and wives, between you know parents and children that you're going to inherit my estate when I die. Oh, no, we have to get rid of all of that. So the propaganda was in these three generations, the first mother ended up getting married young in the traditional way, having a couple of kids and ends up feeling unfulfilled with the boring husband at home and has an affair. <laughs> Eventually she ends the affair and stays with the husband, but always wonders what could have been. Well, then her daughter grows up and this daughter um, decides, well, I'm not going to get married because my mother was restrained by marriage. You know, she couldn't really go out and find herself like she would have had she not been restrained by marriage. So I'm not going to get married, but I do want to have a child. And I, there's a man that I love. So I'm going to have a sexual relationship with him. And, and she has a child with this man, but she outgrows him, right? Because men are silly and immature. And, and she's this uh, very intelligent woman of the world. And she needs more than one man. So they agree to have an open relationship. And she has other lovers and he has other lovers. And they kind of raise the child communally sort of together. Well, one day when the child that came from that relationship, this open marriage, gets of age and she's maybe 17, 18 years old, the mother has gone on a business trip, of course. And this is 1917, you guys, okay? How, what premonition she had. Uh, she comes home from a business trip to find her 17-year-old daughter sleeping with her new boyfriend. Oh, wow. And she's upset. And the daughter and the boyfriend say, why are you upset? This is the new normal. This is what we do now. This is how you raised me. I'm a strong, independent woman, just like you told me to be. You don't have any emotional attachment to him. He doesn't belong to you. So, I mean, would you want me with a stranger? At least this way, you know, like who I'm with and it doesn't mean anything. And the whole book is this woman talking to her friend and saying, is this normal for me? Is this abnormal? Should I be upset? Is it just old notions of jealousy? Is it the old bourgeoisie <laughs> jealousy coming out of me that I need to 
that I need to like get out of my mind and her trying to deal with it. And this whole book was just this giant propaganda piece to prepare women for this idea that you're not going to have a marriage. You're not going to have like a uh, paternity where you know who your child's dad is. And why would you want to? They belong to the state They're They belong to the community. And right. so do you. And so do we all. And this was what they were doing in the Soviet era to try to condition and propagandize women away from the family and to think about career and, and to think of yourself first as a labor unit. Um, but we got the same result here in the West, just with the corporate version, with the corporate liberal version. So, I mean, when you see those two completely supposedly opposite dialectics producing the exact same thing, and we see this in Russia. I mean, everybody knows about abortion rates, divorce rates, things like that in Russia and Ukraine now. And it is a direct product of the propaganda they were, they had thrust upon them, just like what we have here now is a direct result of the propaganda we had thrust upon us a hundred years ago. So there are people who have a vested interest in taking women out of the home, putting them into the workplace. It doubles the tax base. Mm -hmm. It increases the labor pool. It drives down the wages. Yeah. It makes a family wage impossible. So right. now you've got to have a two parent income, which means the kids have to go somewhere all day. Well, most people can't afford full-time childcare, so you send them to state institutions. You put them in, you know, the before school program and the after school program, and then they're in public school all day. And so then the children are getting the propaganda all day from the minute they open their eyes until after dinner most times. Right. So this stuff is not organic and just like came about because women just had this innate need to be corporate cogs and corporate slaves. And the thing I'm always trying to impress upon people is that this is a really bad deal for everyone, especially women. Right. So, and we'll, we'll probably end up going over like the position of women and where they find themselves now. And is this a good deal? I think I can unequivocally prove that it's a terrible deal, but try convincing entire generations of women that they were wrong and that they were duped. It's pretty tough. <laughs> right. No, you're absolutely right. And again, that leads to this sort of archetype of the, the crazy cat lady, because even within witchcraft, the archetype of the witch is a woman who's typically childless, single. And, you know, the black cat motif is that she's surrounded by sort of, uh, uh, you know, nocturnal creatures and stuff like that. But when you're pointing out the sort of dialectic between the Western corporatism and the Eastern communism, both of which necessitate us to agree with it. And we talk about evil in all its different forms. It always requires our volition, our free will to uh, coincide with it, to allow it entry, to support those concepts and ideas. And so, you know, the basis for our discussion today is this Mor Morgan Stanley article. For those of you who don't know, Morgan Stanley is a uh, <clears throat> um, is a bank, isn't it? It's a, uh, and they did this uh, economic report in 2020, looking at what they called the Xi economy. And the Xi economy is this uh, new rise in the prevalence of women in the workforce and how this is a wonderful thing. And, and we can highlight, you can mention anything that you had specific in regard to this article, but to sum it up, um, it kind of hits at uh, a few different a few different areas that um, the growth of single women is outpacing the growth of society itself. So the amount of children we're having and society growing is being outpaced by the increase in women who are identifying as single and unmarried. This then also they tie into the uh, growth in female participation in the labor force and why this is such a great thing because the single uh, economically engaged woman in the workforce is an independent woman. And then this says why this is even a better thing is that single women spend the most money. And so single women buy the most products, the most beauty supplies, the trips, the night outs to the clubs, the nice dinners. And so they make the money and they also spend the money. And this is even true for traditional families is that even in a traditional, say, in a Christian traditional structure where the man makes the money, typically still the woman 
purchases most items. She, what would, is the phrase is controls the purse. So he makes yes. the money, she controls the purse. And, and that's just the general net of things. Again, the women are the gatherers. So the, right. the men are going and hunting for the energy, which in the 21st century is money. And then the women are going and gathering the necessities for the family through the energy that was acquired. And yeah. um, this article then is talking about how these single women are going to elevate their influence into the market, that they're going to stay single longer and they're going to become more career women, which is going to be great because it's going to put upward pressure as it speaks on the low wages of women. So women's wages will increase because more women will be in the workforce to work. More women are going to be single. And so more women are going to purchase more things. And this is great for the economy. And this is just a great thing. This is a great turn in the history of society. And that's basically what this Morgan Stanley article uh, talks about. And so we'll, we'll then talk maybe in retrospect of, of how, you know, different offshoots of this article, what, what in particular regarding this Morgan Stanley article, uh, you know, what was your general thoughts looking it over? Well, it's not surprising to me at all that the corporate banking elite think this is a wonderful thing. <laughs> yeah. um, they're taking women's natural instinct to gather resources, which normally would be for the purpose of, you know, feeding and protecting our offspring, which is our primary biological imperative. And they're, in they're instead exploiting it and turning it into like super consumerism, right? So especially among this age group, we're talking about 25 to 44 single women. Um, like you said, they tend to, like I know a lot of uh, influencers on YouTube and Instagram that I see where maybe three, four, five of these influencer girls, whether they're like fitness influencers, fashion influencers, beauty influencers, whatever they are, they all live together. They'll buy a fancy schmancy, uh, you know, pad in downtown somewhere and they'll live there together. They go on fancy vacations because then you can take awesome pictures for the gram mm -hmm. and then your social media in turn makes you money. What do they do with the money? They get lip implants, breast implants, um, Botox. They're getting beauty treatments, all kinds of crazy beauty treatments. Mm -hmm. So many that I often thank the Lord above that I am 42 and was not born in this generation <laughs> because I would have no interest in keeping up on some kind of insane schedule where I've got like five grand in cosmetic surgery upkeep every month or something like that. But this is like considered winning, right? This is winning now. I'm having mimosas for breakfast. I'm partying at the club with my friends at night. I'm taking sexy pictures of myself in a bikini in an exotic island during the day. And But this, like I said, is only a top percentage of women. And they sell this dream to everyone else. And not shockingly, it, that does not materialize for the vast majority of women who end up waitresses or nurses or teachers at an average of 40,000 a year. Right. Um, and what has happened too, is that m maybe this was short sighted of Morgan Stanley, or maybe this was intentional, but it's like, who is supposed to take care of all these women when they're old, <laughs> who is supposed to take care of them right now? If you look at, um, like nursing homes, the vast majority of the staff are low wage immigrants, yep. many of whom don't even speak English. Yep. That is who is taking care of your grandma, my grandma. Uh, your great grandpa, whoever is in the nursing home now. And for those of you who are concerned about immigration and like too much unchecked immigration, this is a very big problem. There's no way you're going to stem immigration with a 1.6 birth rate. We are well below replacement. We have been for a long time and it's getting worse. In fact, there was predicted a baby boom after COVID because everybody thought if all the moms and dads were locked at home together, they'd be making babies. Turns out that didn't happen. No. We got more divorces instead. Right. And we have even lower birth rate than we did two years ago. Yeah. Suicide went so up. This, alcoholism with, uh, went up. Drug addiction went up. Divorces went up. So the, the opposite of family nuclear structures and copulation uh, occurred. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which is like the saddest thing to me. It's so sad to me, but um, basically, when we look at the numbers here, it, it's for, for us to be such strong, independent women, it's baffling how we fall for this, because here's here's what it looks like when you take this route. OK, you get your bachelor's degree like 35 percent of women have now. Um, 
women in this country now hold two thirds of all college debt. Yeah. Two thirds of all college debt is held by young women. Now that in itself is a barrier to marriage and having children. Mm -hmm. Men are going to be less, you know, it's, it disincentivizes men to marry a woman who's already got the average of $31,276 in college debt. That's the average. That's just the average. That's not all the women who go on to get masters for 120 grand and are never going to pay it off. Right. So that means the average monthly payments, $307. These women, on average, when they get their bachelor's and they get out of college, are making 35000 a year. If you guys want to do the math, they're taking home roughly 2300 bucks a month. $307 is right away going to the student loan. Now, if you have one child, if you just have one child, your average child care per month is going to be 520 So now you're looking at $827 right off the top of whatever you earn right when you have your baby, if you've got this bachelor's, your mm -hmm. average bachelor's degree. Housing, average of 920 a month, car, average of 396 a month. Then you take into account, you gotta have your career wardrobe. You gotta get your beauty treatments yeah. so that you can look professional in the workplace. You gotta buy your lunches. Um, you gotta commute back and forth. Uh, basically, you're not making any money my dear, no. my dear lady, my young mother of one who just got her bachelor's degree and is trying to have a family, it's going to be really hard for you. Like you're not going to make it. Um, it's just a terrible deal when you look at the finances um, of what women make. So basically women are throwing away a family. They're throwing away spending their golden years with a man that they love with children and grandchildren surrounding them who are gonna be there all the time for them when they're old so that they're not alone. They're throwing that all away for 40K a year. Yeah, It's a terrible deal. Don't take the deal. It's it's what I, I think it's the definition of a Faustian bargain. It's the promise of personal enrichment, of you get to focus on you. You don't have to sacrifice for anyone else. You don't have to do anything you don't wanna do. You can get takeout every single night and you can just do what you want. Um, and you don't have to worry about all that icky baby stuff. And this is another thing, the big antinatalist bent to all of this, where children are now portrayed as gross, right. boring, stupid, icky, a pain in the butt. Ugh, who wants to deal with it, right? right. Well, this is what you get. You get $40,000 a year in cats yeah. at the end of it all. And when you die, your corporation is just going to fill your job the next day. And that's your legacy. That's what you leave behind when you leave this earth. Right. So just on a personal level, I think it's a terrible deal, but we'll talk about like the societal implications as well as we go along here. But, um, and then we could talk about the mental health implications. We now have one in four women in the United States on some kind of psychiatric yep. drug diagnosed with some kind of mental illness. It's high among men too, but it's much lower. It's like 15% for men. Uh, women have two and a half times the rate of PTSD. Um, higher rates of alcoholism than men now, Yep. which is staggering. Um, and then the worst part is you look at the stats concerning kids and what's happened to the family. So this, if you guys are interested, is in my Substack article, How's That Feminism Thing Going? Um, so when we think about things like domestic violence. Cause I know there's going to be people watching this going, well, but what do I do if I get married? What if I get a husband and he beats me or he's abusive? And, and, you know, in the past I wouldn't have been able to support myself or get a divorce. What do I do? So again, feminism and this stuff was sold as a way to like deal with this problem, right? That some men are, might be abusive and that some men might be bad to you. Um, Turns out it didn't solve that problem. It made it much worse. Right. And this is a tricky thing uh, with the statistics to dice out because anytime you find stats, they'll say, well, the vast majority of domestic violence goes unreported and maybe less people were reporting back then than they are now. We don't really know. But what we can look at that we do know is rates of child abuse. And we can see that rates of child abuse have actually increased over the last century for one reason. When you break up the family and you take 
the biological dad most often. Sometimes it is the mom. But in either case, when you remove a biological parent and introduce boyfriends, girlfriends, stepmom, stepdads, the rate of abuse goes up exponentially. It's something like 20 times higher when there's a non-biological parent in the house. Um, so when, when abuse. Yeah, the sexual abuse, the physical abuse, the rate of deadly child abuse is like five times higher. Wow. The chances that your child's going to die from the abuse are far higher if it's from a, a non-biological parent. Um, and then I found a, a terrible study where they looked at a child psych ward and found that of all the kids admitted to this psych ward, 88% of them came from non-traditional homes where there was some kind of disruption, some kind of divorce or dad wasn't there, mom wasn't there, some kind of disruption in the traditional family structure, 88%. Now, if you look at all those stats together, you know that those are not independent of each other. They're not a coincidence. This all stems from destroying marriage and the family and telling women, go to work first, get a college degree and then go to work. And then once you've got all of that done and you're 35, then think about having kids, right? Because there's a few things that happen to women in the current system that are worse than before. One would be if you are in your 30s and you do decide at the last minute, at the 11th hour that you want kids, you're pretty desperate, right. right? So you're much more likely than maybe if you were a high status um, 20, 20, 22 year old who had high sexual market value, you have a pretty good pick of different guys. And yep. you could, if you had good parents who taught you correctly, find men who come from stable homes with good reputations, from good families. They go to church. They have, you know, they have a lot to lose. They're not just going to beat the crap out of you because if they do, they could stand to lose everything they have, right? So you could pick someone that would give you a very good shot at having a good, stable life. When you're 35 and you just have to like look around and find the first guy who will take a 35-year-old career woman, that's going to be tough. And then trying to all of a sudden at 35 adjust to life as a mother doesn't go well in my experience. It's very hard. Uh, somebody like me, I had my first baby at 20. You're very adaptable when you're young. You can go without sleep. Um, and you haven't gotten into this habit of having a decade or two of doing whatever you want, going to bed whenever you want, thinking only of yourself. It's like, you just jump into motherhood and you tend to adapt really well. Right. When you're trying to do that at 35 or 40, it's like mentally crippling. These women have much higher rates of postpartum depression, of um, tr trouble adjusting to life, you know, at home or life at, with their child. Um, and so, yeah, it's just uh, we, we've inverted everything. Yeah. We've inverted the social order. We've inverted the life cycle of women. Um, and we can look at what happens to kids as some pretty good proof of why this is a really terrible idea. And it hasn't made women less vulnerable. It hasn't made children less vulnerable. It turns out that a hundred years ago or 150 years ago, when they were trying to say, well, men are the cause of all the social problems, right? If there's any discord in the home, it has to be that the man is a violent beast. Well, no, <laughs> turns out that's not exactly correct. And that making women single and isolating them does not protect them from abuse. No, it does and it doesn't opposite. protect children from abuse. It makes them more vulnerable. How many times have you seen a news article where some predator sought out a single mom? Because what are single moms? They're vulnerable. There was just recently, I was in the gym and there was a whole thing. I think it was here in Indiana. A single mom is missing with her daughter that she was out and about with her little girl, cute little girl, probably four or five, and now they're both missing. And uh, exactly, if you were if you were a predator, I mean that's who you'd go after is single yeah. women. And then if you're a pedophile, that's those are the children you're going to go after is the single women. And how how many times do we hear that? There was a CNN contributor that was uh, that was uh, meeting women and then paying them to sleep with their daughters. And it went as low as like, and one woman accepted and she was like 11 years old. This was all, this was all uh, found out and the guy was arrested. But, um, you know, yeah. the, as you were talking about these women choose, you know, uh, God rest, uh, Kevin Samuels, m 
you know, memory eternal to him, but in some of his little clips, and I'm not here to, to promote everything that he talked about or whatever he said, but one some of the clips, just hearing the women call in, you know, they'll be talking about, oh, you can't trust any of these men. All these men are cheaters, you know, you know, and he's like, well, well, ma'am, you know, do you have children? Yeah, I got two kids. Um, okay, where is the husband of your children? Oh, no, he, I, we never got married. He's in jail. Okay. Uh, what, tell me a little bit about your last relationship. Oh yeah. He whooped my ass. I got to get out of there. Cause he, he was abusive. All men, you know, they cheat or they beat. And it's like, man, so you're telling me you're, you choose felons, you choose ass beaters, <laughs> you choose cheaters. Like that's, it sounds, it's more like a you problem than a men problem. And, and this is the difficulty of women of the self-reflection is, again, with the status of the sort of sexual market, they have access to the sex. The men have access to marriage. Women don't want marriage, and the men are being trained to just want sex. And so the women are getting all of this extra societal leverage, and so then they can pick and choose. They can pick and choose. Um, and it's like, well, you're getting what you're choosing. You're get, like right. you're in charge, and it, it, it stems from, as you highlighted, the sort of narcissism and self-absorption of one's pleasures and we talked about earlier how in a way career women act like gay men in the marketplace because that's really my only utility as a man if i'm going to get with a career woman my utility is how i please her it's not yeah. how i provide for it's not right. even how good of a father i'm going to be because those are totally secondary uh questions and yeah. so you know, this inability to serve others is indicative of the social media. So you talked about how these women and the hypergamy and how these girls will, these influencers will they all live together and they'll all sort of uh, parrot this lifestyle of opulence and luxury. But um, it, it, it's all a facade and it causes the women then to want those things, to try to choose those men. They're going to give them those things. But the, the amount of men who actually are making that amount of money are such a small portion right. that all these women then are being inundated with the message. Oh, I have to get a millionaire. I have to get a man that makes a $500,000. I have to get an NBA star. I have to get a, a, you know, a professional athlete. I need to get a rap star. And you see this culture, uh, develop, especially over the last 10 to 15 years of this idea that all these girls, if you're, if you're say seven or higher average beauty of these girls, they think, especially if they came from a wealthy family. This is where the hypergamy is such a very difficult conversation because as a father with a daughter, you'd want her to marry up, but also in the way that the social media then is affecting the landscape of dating itself, all the women are going for such a small amount of men. Yeah. Of course, those men are going to probably have access to more women. They probably are going to cheat uh, to certain degrees, but uh, it skews the whole landscape and the whole point of the relationships in the first place. Because again, the women are so narcissistic and self-absorbed. It's not about family. It's not about serving somebody. It's not about contributing to the man's legacy or his purpose or whatever his career is. It's about self-serving them. And so in that turn, everything they do is actually anti-life. So, yes. so not only are the abortions, not only is the sterile sex, not only is the divorces, I mean, the harm on the children because women in the black community initiate divorce at an 80% rate. And then in non-black it's 75%. So it's not like it's any better. Women uh, instigate divorce on, on a mass scale. Why? It's typically due to sex, boredom or money. Yes. <laughs> and everybody thinks it's abuse. And this drives me crazy because you guys know I do a lot of debates. They think like they make this assumption that it's abuse. No, abuse is like way down. It's like somewhere between fifth and seventh, depending on what survey you look at. The vast majority of women, when polled of why they initiated divorce, it's something like, I didn't feel sexy anymore. I was bored. I needed to find myself. It's something like that. And uh, this is where I always get myself into trouble, but I feel like this is so important to say. Um, the psychology of women today in the current society that we find ourselves in, wh where we've got social media and we've got the Kardashians and we've got Beyonce, and these are the these are the girls that everyone looks up to. I mean, somebody like Charlie D'Amelio on TikTok makes twenty million dollars for doing a twenty second dance on the TikTok, right? So all the young girls grow up looking at that, thinking that's the thing. That's the model. That's the model for success. This is what society thinks is 
beautiful, attractive, uh, successful, this is what I have to do. Some form of that, right? You either want to be Kylie Jenner and have your own fashion empire, or you want to be, you know, uh, some kind of something like that, right. an and influencer. Then, yeah, and not marry, but date a rap star and then have babies with. That's exactly what these women want. Oh, I'll be like a Kylie Jenner. I'll augment my whole my whole uh, appearance. I'll get with a you know a rapper who promotes you know. <laughs> sinful degenerate lifestyle we'll put it that way and then we'll have babies and then uh yeah i'll just make as much money and i'll promote as much sex and and you know frivolous things as possible and that will be my success yeah and the hard truth about it is that the vast majority of these women when it comes down to it and they won't admit this because it's such a difficult thing to admit but really the motivation for all this stuff is i want attention and I want validation. Right. And I also, while getting the attention and validation, don't want anyone to tell me what to do. Right. Which, which is, this is a tricky one because deep, deep down, yes, you do. I know you're looking at me right now and you're going, no, I don't. Just because you want to have some man telling you what to do doesn't mean that <laughs> I, I would never, I know I can do it myself, right? You're all thinking that you're wrong. That's not true. You do not really want a man who will let you get away with murder and be right. crazy and act ridiculous, right? So you look at all the celebrities. I don't know if you guys remember back in the day, there was this elevator video that came out with Beyonce and her sister and Jay-Z in the elevator. And Beyonce's sister just starts beating the crap out of Jay-Z. And he just like put up with it. This was like a big thing, like maybe 10 years ago. Um, and, and this is what you see all the time. Like among famous couples, they always get divorced. And it's always like, there's domestic violence, there's cheating, there's craziness, like Giselle and Tom Brady just got divorced. Like all these Hollywood actors and actresses are always getting divorced. And nine times out of 10, the reason, the real reason women want to leave the relationship is because it's like, if they have this idea that the man should not push back, right? That the man shouldn't put his foot down and say, we won't have any of that craziness. Like you go watch the old movies from like the forties or fifties and the woman will be hysterical and the man will be like, no, no, we won't have any of that. <laughs> Calm down. And you know, it's like, and then the woman will like, you know, take her little hanky and he'll say, here's your handkerchief and just calm down and have a drink. And why don't you just sit down and take a nap, go to your room and calm down. Um, that's what men used to do right. because we're women. We're emotional. We have crazy hormones. I'm a very rational person, but I will tell you that there are certain times where I get crazy and it's not really totally something I can control. It is incumbent upon me to control myself, obviously, but I, it's been very, very beneficial for me to have a stable, calm man in my life to kind of um, check myself against when I wonder like, okay, am I being dramatic? Am I being a little wishy-washy? Am I just being like really emotional about this? And, you know, I have somebody to go to and bounce that off of, or I have somebody who loves me enough to be like, listen, I know you're really upset about this thing. It's going to be fine. Like it's, I will help you. Right. right? Um, and nowadays when women have that in a relationship, it's controlling, right. it's right. abusive. If I had a dollar for every time I heard somebody refer to, you know, a man just being the voice of reason, being the centering for the emotional woman. And you'll see this publicly. Women will be like, oh, did you see that? He's so abusive. Look at what, look how he just shut her down. Look at how he hushed her. That's so abusive. What a misogynist. And it's, it's like considered, oh, he's trying to control me. Oh, he thinks he's my dad. No, men are supposed to be like the rational uh, force in the, in the marriage and in the family. Men are supposed to be the ones that provide like that stability when we can be very up and down, depending on, you know, you just had a baby and your hormones are crazy. It's that time of the month and your hormones are crazy. Right. And we right. just tend to be more emotional overall. And so many women have been trained with this idea that if a man tries to be rational with you, that he's abusive. And I'm so sick of hearing that. It's like anything a man does besides worship you is now abuse. <laughs> right. And we've, We've got to push back against that because that is insane. It is insane. And it, this Aubrey is how we end up with things like, okay, who is putting all the kids on the hormones? 
Who is out there telling their four-year-old to transition and that he's really a girl? Not men. Right. Not single dads. Not single no. dads. It's feminized men who are married to, to masculine dominant women who are bought it in all this yeah. program. And when you and when... or single moms. Mm -hmm. Or single moms. There's that case in Texas where the parents divorced, the mom wants to tra transition the boys, and even the courts in Texas told yep. the dad, sorry. You can't interfere with this. We're turning yep. your son into a girl and yep. there's nothing you can do about it yep. because the mom has custody. Yep. This is a very, very bad idea. <laughs> we can't, we can't take all of the stability masculinity offers and throw it out the window for women's feelings that it, it, that's not good for women. You might sit here and think it is. It's not. You will end up with hell. That's what you'll get. And that's why it's important for this balancing act between men and women is that, as you pointed out, uh, men can be a sort of rational, uh, sobering force for women. But women also in their emotions, just the fact that they are more emotional isn't a slight because they're also no. more intuitive in certain ways. And so you being a mother could could absolutely articulate how women also, that's why God made us the way that we are. Men are naturally yeah. more rational. Women are naturally more emotional. And, and when they're together, they can become one flesh. And that really is the way that we're all intended to be. And because the woman, if I'm the head, again, if, if Christ is the head of the church and the church is the body, uh, the, the man is the head and the woman is the body, uh, mimicking Christ, that the, the man is the sort of rational force. In a way, the woman is the heart. She's the one that feels. She senses. She intuits the world. It's not a rational process. And so right. they both need to feed back on each other. And so when the woman doesn't have that, that rationalizing, sobering force and is also in opposition to it, it's going to lead into hyper-emotional um, erraticism. And that is then the, the narcissism, the self-absorption is because it only goes back to the emotionalism of satisfying and satiating my pleasures and desires. Yes. And outside of that, I really don't know what to do. And so, like you said, those shit test men uh, to try to see if they're that person, but at the same time, they actually don't want it. And they're so right. confused. They're, <laughs> the women are so confused because they want the attention, but they get all the attention on social media, but then they get the man and they want his attention. But then because he, they're upset with him, they'll do something on social media, get the attention of all. And it's like this weird women are so caught They're They're so manipulated by the system right now, playing off their emotionalism and their yes. lack of rationality and forward thinking and looking at how all this stuff is affecting society and where's it all going to go in generation and the, in the second generation after that. And it, because they're only focused on their pleasure, they don't get it. Yes. And it's very fear based too. This is another thing I like to point out is we scaremonger the crap out of women that the career path is safe and sure and what smart, rational, cool women do, right? You would never, why would you ever base your future on a man or a family? Because that could fall apart. I mean, we, we scaremonger women to death about this. It's like, oh, but that could break up 50% of divorces, you know, marriages end in divorce. And what if he beats you? And what if he's mean? Or what if you don't like him anymore? What if he gets fat? What if he goes bold? What if, what if, what if, what if? But nobody ever says, what if you get your degree and then there's not a job for you? Right. What if you uh, have a career and they eliminate your position? <laughs> this happened to a woman that I know who is in her 60s. They eliminated her position at her job and it just sent her spiraling into a deep depression and she just kind of went crazy and it was because and she finally mm. like kind of told me well it's because i didn't have the control i've never not had the control they they didn't ask me they just eliminated my position and just it wasn't my choice to like retire early i was like forced into it and now i don't have anything i want to do i don't have anything i know to do and, you know, everyone was suggesting to her, you could spend time with your grandkids. You could, um, you know, you could volunteer somewhere. You could do more stuff at church. And she was like in such a depression that she was like, I don't want to do any of that. I don't even want to leave my house. It was horrible, like to watch this happen to this woman. And I think boomer generation women are in the worst of it now, but I'm really afraid for what's going to happen to like millennial and zoomer women when they get older. I don't know if the narcissism will just be so deep and everything will be so nihilistic by then that they just won't care. Like, I don't, it's hard for me to imagine it being worse than it is for all of these boomer generation women who are in their sixties and seventies and they're like alone and lost and 
feel like it wasn't a great deal for them. Right. And, and, but they also at the same time are never, it's very hard for them to admit, oh, I got duped and this wasn't the right, I chose the wrong thing, right? That's hard. It's hard to look back at your whole life and say, oh shit, I shouldn't have divorced my husband and put everything into the career. Right. I shouldn't have done that. I should have let the career go a little more and maybe I could have done that when I was older or something. I should have put all my eggs in the family basket. It's the stubbornness of them to not want to admit that, right? It's always someone else's fault, which is another thing that I say about women that gets me a lot of trouble. I'm sorry, ladies, but a lot of us, a lot of us do not want to take responsibility, even at the same time as we are saying we're such strong, independent women. When our life turns out bad, it's always like the patriarchy's fault or society's fault or someone else's fault. And we're just like these innocent victims and life just like happened to us and we were doing our best. How many boomer age moms have I heard where it's like they had an affair, broke up the family, the guy they cheated with dumped them and now they're alone and they don't have any money and, and everything's terrible, right? And it's it's never... I shouldn't have had the affair. I shouldn't have chosen this bad guy or whatever. It's always like, well, I didn't know. And it wasn't my fault. And he didn't make me feel pretty. And there's always like these excuses. And I think it's because all of the propaganda is there telling them this right. and giving them this easy out. And it's just such a psychopathic, narcissistic way of trying to get women to be. And I think the only like glimmer of hope there is all these women who are writing me saying, I don't want this. I don't want this, but I feel like I can't tell anyone because everyone expects this of me. But I just, I just want to stay home with my baby. Like I just had a baby and that's all I really care about now. And I don't know how to tell people and, and we're going to have to downsize our living situation and we're going to have to make some sacrifices and, and then they feel guilty about that too. Right. So it's like, if there's anything I'm trying to do is I'm just trying to make it okay for women to just be women again. Right. If all you want to do is take care of your babies and make your house beautiful and think of what new dinner to make for your husband when he gets home, that is awesome. It and is. it's okay. And you're not some loser and the boss bitch is the cool girl, you know, uh, just that stuff's all garbage and it leads to a very empty and lonely place. It leads to the cat lady right. meme. And it, it, one of the things that I wrote down in regards to uh, what you were saying, when you mentioned the woman and they eliminated her job, it brought up a whole series of questions in regards to what is meaning, what is purpose, because a job they can't take away from you is being a mother. A job right. they can't take away from you is being a good wife. And so women in the search for it really being inundated with the commodification of the world, uh, consumerism, and this pursuit for money, that money must equal purpose, money must equal meaning. And so, oh, well, I want more meaning in my life, so I'm going to be a career woman. I'm going to put all this stuff to the side. And then as you highlight, well, all this stuff can be taken from you. The things that are authentic, the things that are most real about living in the world and being human are not related to money, and you can't touch them either. Uh, you can touch your children, but you can't touch like motherhood and what it means to be a mother. You can't touch love. You can't touch these transcendent things that we know are more real and more important. And so if women stop pursuing money as this end all be all, they have they would realize that there's aspects of themselves like giving birth and having children and being part of a family that is more meaningful, more purposeful. And yes, you don't get the exchange of money in the in the short period, but you'll get the exchange of a fulfilled life in the end, especially once you're most uh, postmenopausal, where these women who, you know, are 38 and now they're trying to scramble to find a guy or they're trying to freeze their eggs or or you know, oh, I just need I just need a guy to have a baby, but at the same time maybe they make like you said, $150,000 a year. And, and so even yeah. just to get pregnant, they're still, I have all these demands on, on what type of man it's not going to happen. And it's because your you, your mind is too wrapped up in the paradigm of the inverted world. You need right. to step back and find out what is really real. 
and you being a mother and, and loving somebody and being self-sacrificial. This is where Christ then comes into what a relationship is and what a marriage is and how women and men are supposed to uh, get along and become one flesh. It's through the self-sacrifice. And so that's where the narcissism and self-absorption is literally the ultimate hindrance for, to, to prevent women from being women. And so instead right. of being the mother, they become the harlot. And this is the empowered woman where the mother, the, the Theotokos figure, that archetype is now uh, trampled upon and, and demonized, as you said, as like a, a lesser version of what it means to be a yeah. woman. When really that's the highest. That's what makes a woman a woman, because men can't do that. Men can well, go make I, money and work for, you know, yeah. the Shell Corporation, whatever it is. Yeah, I, I think what you said earlier, and I had never thought about this before, but it's so true about the modern woman mimicking the gay male lifestyle. I think that that it coincides perfectly with taking away women's identity as a whole. Like everybody's seen, you know, the what is a woman question. It's like we don't even know what a woman is anymore because now men can be women and that's like a whole that's a whole different demonic inversion where <laughs> yeah. oftentimes the men who hate women the most and i've spoken to one i've spoken to a male who's transitioning to try to become a woman about why he was doing this and it boiled down to he really hates women he you know he was like an incel type um who felt like fine you won't have me, I'll become one of you. And then what are you gonna do? And it was like out of this bitterness and spite. Um, and then yesterday there was a viral video of a male bodybuilder who was transitioning to female and he was talking all kinds of shit about women and how their bench press sucks and how <laughs> they don't have good upper body strength and all that. It was insane. And it went viral because Greg Doucette made like a video going, it's because you're a man, wow. you know? and. And then the people who want to validate the trans stuff get upset. And then the women are upset and everyone's upset. So we really have like womanhood has been the first identity to go. I know we're all talking about toxic masculinity and that's terrible. And I speak out against that all the time, yeah, but it exists. womanhood as an identity, it, they're trying to just literally get rid of it. And I think these are all steps to the transhumanist future. Um, and the first one to go is womanhood. And this started like we said over a hundred years ago with trying to just erase womanhood and say, now you can be just like a man. You can just have a bunch of sex partners. You can just have a job and um, you know, either your job will keep you warm at night or you can live in a commune and that'll be just as good. In fact, it'll be better, right? Because look at the family and look at how oppressive it is. Look at how constrained you are in a family situation, which if you ever do get to where, I am, and I am thankful every single day because, uh, you know, I had a, a family that was broken up when I was a kid and all I ever wanted really was to put that back together and to have that intact family, the stability, the like certainty and the love and the, like, why the hell are we going through all this? Like, why go through such difficult times that we all go through in life if there isn't even going to be any of that there? when right. when things are terrible that's what i really wanted and through lots of hard work of deprogramming all that craziness mm -hmm. i finally did get there and andrew and i worked on that together mm. like we both came together and worked through all the garbage that we had both been programmed with from our parents from society from whatever because we really both wanted this family and we've gotten there and when you get there it's so much better and it, and you feel like it's a secret you have to tell everyone because nobody knows <laughs> it's almost like no 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 you're doing it wrong i swear this is the best i know everybody is crapping all over it but it's amazing and it's great and it's so true and this um demonic inverted vision that you've all been sold it's as bad as it sounds. And then you look at how it's going to destroy not just society, but perhaps we're looking at a human ex extinction level event. Yeah. If things were to continue trending this way, because it's not just here, every country in the world, except I think India and a handful of African countries right. are well below replacement. Yep. There won't be enough immigrants to send everywhere right. to do everything. Right. 
And we know that the, the architects of this stuff are very interested in things like depopulation yep. because they think that depopulation will get them to this transhumanist future right. where a chosen smaller few will get all the resources and um, transcend the human condition without God. Right. right. Totally demonic as you've, you've done so many streams on that that are so fantastic, but that's the end goal of this, like the corporate stuff and the banks making all the money and the government's getting double the tax base. That's like a short term windfall for them. But the long term windfall is to atomize everyone, depopulate and end up in this demonic transhuman future. So if you think you can be part of that and it's not going to affect you. You would be wrong, right? You know, and that, like you talked about, the the brink of, uh, of almost a minor extinction event, which is uh, from all research seems like it's getting ready to happen. It's the spirit of the Antichrist again. It's the death spirit. It's the sterile spirit that is in opposition to life. It's in opposition to God. It's in opposition to what is true and good. And everything is perverted, everything is inverted, and we can see with see this in the fact that so many populations, once they get exposed to these ideas in one way or another, stop having that nuclear family, stop having children at the replacement rate, and they they consume, but they don't produce in the same way. Yes, and that's and that as a man, I think that's a t you know. One of the things I think every man should strive for is to produce more than he consumes. That's what makes a man a man, and that's how you contribute to society. You want to produce more value than you consume. Uh, but we see the state of the world, the inversion of all this stuff. Um, and, and that's like, again, the Christ archetype. Christ came here to give, right? He didn't consume. He gave. He produced salvation. He, he, was, a, he was a giver of life. And so... We are all wrapped up in this commodification, consumerism that is both men and women. That's why the men want to consume then the product of these sexual insta girls as opposed to doing, you know, going the long route. You got to become yeah. a, the traditional man. So the traditional girl will want to be with you. It's not. I know. And that's where our that's where the challenge is for people like you and me who are trying to encourage people not to go down this bad path is that what we're trying to sell people is not easy either, right? right? Um, it's an ascetic lifestyle. And we've talked about this before, that marriage is sacrifice, motherhood is sacrifice. But like I was saying, it's sacrifice that ultimately it really does bring you a type of joy and peace. It doesn't mean that every day I get up is easy, you guys. And I'm not saying, you know, like the, the career girl who's the Instagram influencer who makes six figures off her social media, she does get to get up every day and have mimosas and get a massage and go to the Gucci store and all these things that she's doing. And maybe my reality looks more boring to you, maybe getting up and making the whole family breakfast and then, you know, cleaning it up and then going to the gym and then coming home and, you know, doing doing housework or the bills or, you know, maybe studying for a stream or something I'm doing now that my kids are a little older. But when I was younger, it was just like it was just nonstop laundry and dishes and, and all that stuff. And that was plenty unglamorous. OK, I'm not trying to sell you um, a load of BS. There was a lot of self-sacrifice. There was a lot of really tired days. There was a lot of challenges. But you do get to this point where you start to see all of that hard work and all of that investment turn into something that's way bigger than you. Right. That transcends, it transcends me and it is far bigger than me. If I were to die tomorrow, you guys... I feel like I've already accomplished like real greatness because there are four human beings who are going to go out into the world and make it better right. than it would have been had I not put all of that into them. My husband is forever changed because of me and I'm forever changed because of him. Mm -hmm. Andrew talks about that all the time. He'll tell you on the stream that he just likes my cookies, but then he'll also begrudgingly say, yes, she really like domesticated me. And if it weren't <laughs> for her, God knows what I'd be doing. I might be, you know, living under a bridge with my dog. I think he has actually said that before. <laughs> so um, it's not that it's easy or glamorous. It's that it's worthwhile, right? So you have to choose. Do you want like meaning, real meaning, like something real and true that you're willing to sacrifice for? Or do you want all this surface level garbage, just 
make me feel good, make me feel good, try to fill the hole with mimosas and Gucci shoes and attention from a guy on Tinder and all that stuff. Right. And talk to older women. Yeah. If you're not sure, talk to older women who've taken both paths and see where they are. My grandma's 96 and um, she was a typical traditional lady and she um, she's just like an amazing person. Like I look at her 96 years of life and I'm blown away by how much she's been through and that she's still like this sweet, good, hopeful person who likes people. You know what I mean? There's no darkness in her at all. She's like, a, a loving, happy, peaceful, the kind of woman that like when she's in the room, everybody's just smiling and she's got this glow to her and everybody reveres her. Everybody respects her. That's not what these Instagram thoughts are going to have when they're 96. They're not going to have anything like that. If they ever even make it that far, you know, it's like you, you have to decide what you really want. Right. And um, this dead end materialism stuff is why everybody's on SSRIs, why we have so many wine moms or like wine aunts, you know, women that have this secret alcohol problem, but because it's wine, because it's, it's a little wine tasting board that I have or something, it's somehow not alcoholism, even <laughs> though it completely totally is. Um, and, you know, they're on pills and they're on all kinds of stuff. And and then we've got the incel problem is another like offshoot of this woman problem. And, right. and th those we are look the around and we're like, why is everything so terrible? Right. You know? it, it is. It's another offshoot. And one of the things that I wrote down while you're talking is um, everything is a sacrifice. You're talking about the sacrifice for having children and the love and care, time and attention that you put into them. But even the girls that's having the mimosas with the Gucci shoes, it's a different sacrifice. She's sacrificing pieces of her own soul, of her own, of herself for what you get. And this is true for everything. You want to get fit, you yeah. got to sacrifice. You want to make money, you got to sacrifice. You want to get married, you got to sacrifice. If you want to follow Christ, you got to sacrifice. Everything that you want to do is going to involve a sacrifice. It just depends on what you're sacrificing. And these women, in a way, are sacrificing their future. They're sacrificing the opportunity for children. And, and many times they're actually sacrificing their child through abortion. And so um, yeah. looking at sacrifice and what is it that we're sacrificing, this is just a reflection that all people could do right now as 2023 just, start, just started, is looking at what exactly are am I devoting my time and attention to and what am I sacrificing and not sacrificing and what could potentially change to move me in one direction or another in the right, in the right place. And, and so we all need to think about that. And, and even the women who appeared to not be sacrificing in the immediate moment are in fact, sacrificing something yeah. that they can't get back. And whereas yeah. uh, if you wanted to go work right now, if you wanted to go have a mimosa or buy Gucci shoes, you still could, but you've already yeah. sacrificed in the immediate moment back with the children and, and growing them and aiding them and developing them. And that's something again, is not, you don't get paid for it. You don't get a dollar right. amount for it. And even the welfare system trying in 19, starting in 1964, trying to pay women for children. It's, it's again, it's, it's that commodifying mindset. Oh, well, maybe if I have another different baby with another baby daddy, well, I get another two grand a month or something like that. It's like, right. this is the, this is the problem. This is the opposite of sacrifice. And what you're doing then now you're sacrificing the well-being of the children for your own pleasure which again gets us back to this archetype of the girl who becomes the old cat lady is that the narcissism and self-absorption prevents her from sacrificing and it prevents her from service to other people which prevents her from true femininity it's a right. bastardized distorted form of sexual femininity which isn't really feminine and that's why i said it's more like a gay man it's it's this it's yes you're a woman and maybe you have you know great breast and butt and a great body but the way you portray the way you move in the world is too masculine. It's not true femininity. It's an inverted form of femininity. And so, you know, moving into the next point I wanted to, to discuss is that if a woman then is average looking or better, and she's say 30 years old or older, and she's still single, I think questions arise that, that aren't about men. It should be about right. why are you, if you're really pretty, and you're 33 years old, 35, 38, 40, and you're single, it's probably something about you while you're alone. Because 
if you're an average looking woman or better, there is no doubt that multiple men have hit on you. Multiple women have tried to be with you. Multiple men have tried to court you or, or one way or another. You've said, no, not this person slept with this guy, broke up here. This guy didn't treat you right. He cheated on you, whatever it is. You've just gone on this sort of carousel wheel of relationships and that is more and more damage. And there's something about you that is preventing you from actually being a strong partner in a relationship. And so therefore, why would a man choose a woman who's single, especially if she's better than average looking, who's in her mid thirties, because there's already a red flag because you should be married. Why are you not married? Somebody has already wanted to marry you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And that's I would say that's even true for women who might be lower on that scale, because I know women who are not the most physically attractive and yet have maybe had two dozen partners by the time they're 40. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And still none of them were good enough. Right. right. There was always something wrong with every one of them. And um, I had a discussion with a friend a couple of years ago about this, where she was talking to me about this problem. And she said, you know, I want to be more like you. I want to be like a mom and like be one of those self-sacrificing, like mom, wife type of people that's always cooking for everyone and taking care of people. And they're sick. Like, I want to be that. But she's like, I just don't feel like that's me. I don't feel like I can do that. And I said, I don't think that's the problem. And, and this was something that she was very mad at me for saying. <laughs> She got over it after thinking about it for a while, but at first she was really upset and hung up on me because I said, I think, to be honest with you, the real problem is that you know that in order to get a man worth doing that sacrifice for, that you have to be a woman who would attract that kind of man and you don't want to make those changes. Right. You don't want to change those, those things about yourself that you know are lacking because that hurts. That hurts, especially when women like, on this fake crap that we do to women all the time where we tell them, oh, you're beautiful just the way you are. And this is specific to women. We don't really do this with men. With men, you know, men think that they have to provide value in order to be valued. With women, we go, you can be healthy at any size and you can be beautiful no matter what. And you're perfect the way you are. And you shouldn't have to change anyone for anyone or anything. And the world should change to accommodate you. <laughs> right. So these younger generations have grown up with this beaten and beaten and beaten into their head. So for a woman, by the time she hits maybe 30 and she's looking at herself and going, oh, the reason I keep ending up with these like kind of bottom of the barrel dudes who are always going to cheat on me, who are never going to commit to me, who are always going to kind of treat me like crap is because I kind of act like someone who's going to attract those type of guys. And that's just such a painful thing. For a woman to admit now that doesn't mean that you are inherently not valuable as a human it means you have shit to work on it means you have issues that you need to fix you have to do some work on yourself and get your act together and change your priorities change your behavior you know maybe not be so crazy maybe <laughs> not drink all the time you know the things that women do that lead them to this wacky trashy behavior that attracts wacky trashy dudes okay right. You're not some super classy dame who's just got it all together and all you can attract is trashy guys who are going to cheat. No, there's something you're doing. You have uh, habits, repetitions, you have patterns that are attracting these men. And there's a reason why you don't think you want them, but you keep accepting them and you keep letting them into your life. Because if he's kind of messed up, he can't expect too much from you. Whereas if you get a really good, valuable man who's virtuous, he's going to expect virtue out of you. <laughs> right. So, and I think there's so many women that don't want to admit that to themselves because of this. Everyone's perfect just the way they are. You, any man should love you exactly the way you are because you're this precious, perfect little, you know, wonderful woman. It's like, no. We're not special. We're human beings too. And we all come with our own baggage and our own crap and our own weaknesses that we need to work on too. And we just don't tell that to women anymore. No, we don't. And I think it's a terrible disservice. Well, I think women are the least honest with other women. And that's the yeah, biggest totally. problem is 
Uh, the boomer narrative of this self-empowered independent woman hasn't worked out for anybody, and yet nobody wants to admit they made a mistake, and they're still telling their daughters to do the exact same thing. And you're yeah. having this phenomenon um, in all communities, but we could point to the black community where these uh, mothers, black mothers are single. They're now in their 40s, 50s, 60s or whatnot, and it's their children that are taking care of them. And so their daughters now, she has a job and she's 25 or 30 and she's helping mama and she lives alone in the apartment. Or uh, you have what's called the... Uh, the you know the husband son where it's the son and he he cares for mom and he's taking care of mom with his money but he, then he is devoting his resources and allocating his time and attention to taking care of mom because she's single and since then the single mom has has influenced both children to perpetuate the same problem that she finds herself in. Yeah, I will occasionally run into men on social media who will be like really. Uh abnormally angry at me for the things that I talk about. And I will kind of just like ask questions. And what we always end up with is this man is protecting his mother, right? It'll be like, well, not all single moms, some single moms had to get a divorce because they were in a really bad situation. And, and what do you want her to do? Quit her job because, well, doesn't her happiness matter? Her happiness matters too, right? And they're very defensive of like, the liberal women, right? And and through the course of talking to them, I almost always find that they were raised by a single mom who told them their dad wasn't shit, their dad's terrible, um, their dad's a cheater, he's a this, he's a that, right? And they're raised with this idea that it's incumbent upon them to make mommy happy. And if they have to sacrifice everything so that mommy can be happy, well, that's just what needs to be done. And you wouldn't want mommy to be sad or upset. And I think I think this is a terrible thing to do to children for women to take their, their mistakes. Uh, like you chose the wrong guy and maybe you didn't know he was a bad guy. And maybe you were young and maybe you were naive. It's still your responsibility. I've been there. Everybody knows that I was married before Andrew and I did not pick well. And that was my responsibility. Right. So I've never like, placed that onto my kids and like made that into their issue. I think that's a horrible mistake to do. And um, usually when men are really defensive of single moms, it's because they're protecting their single mom who they believe because mom trained them. I'm the victim. I'm the innocent victim. I was just floating through life and bad men happened to me and I'm sorry, but that doesn't happen. You don't just float through bad life or through life and bad men happen to you. You always are choosing who you're sleeping with right. every single time. And we attract, you know, it's almost every relationship balances itself out. And yeah. um, you can see this with the effeminate man with the more masculine woman or the really masculine man with the traditional values with the really feminine traditional girl. The only way those things work is that they have to balance each other out. And so, uh, you know, as, as you highlight, you know, it can't be skewed in one way or another. And also that right. rhetoric of not respecting men and how men ain't shit and all this different stuff and how you're, you know, this is a, this narrative, this rhetoric is much more dangerous. And I would say, uh, negatively efficacious in many ways, because by the absence of respecting men, women naturally are going to also not respect God and tradition and all these larger things that are going to be related to masculinity or the patriarchy, yes. all this stuff. And so it naturally leads to a woman who's constantly in aversion to natural order, life, God, purity, virtue. And it even leads to naturally then the, the crazy cat lady, which we named the stream after with the, um, what are they called? The toxoplasmosis. So the actual yeah. toxins that come out of cat uh, feces, yeah. which then can be taken into one's brain. And then even uh, some scholars have argued actually control the behavior of the organism that it's inhabited in. So it's a sort of parasite. And so this is still death. It's still like the, the in being an aversion to uh, God, to natural order, it always leads to chaos. It always leads to more death. 
And not that, you know, you don't have to be a crazy cat lady to get toxoplasmosis. Anybody right. can, if you're exposed to it, you know, through cat feces. The point is, obviously, the character and the archetype of the crazy cat lady of why she's so crazy and irrational is because of the amount of key, the cats and the, you know, feces that may she may be around or even changing litter. You know, pregnant women are told not to change yeah. cat, cat litter because potentially they could be exposed to toxoplasmosis and that can be transmitted to their baby. So yeah. um, this aversion to men and not respecting men at all leads to a wholesale aversion to all of masculinity, all right. of order. And that way, then they're only led by their emotionism. Again, that back to that narcissism and that self-pleasure, yeah. which derive, you know, directs them eventually to that crazy cat lady yeah. by the time they get 50 and 60. That's how they end up with anything Anything that even approaches masculinity equals abuse. This is how we ended up with this insanity where it's like just a man being a normal man is now abusive, right? And every stupid YouTube girl on earth has made videos about how her ex-boyfriend is a narcissist. Every man who isn't a total simp is an abusive narcissist now. <laughs> totally untrue. It's absurd. Um, but... But one thing that is true is that by rejecting masculinity and by embracing feminism and inverting that order, it by destroying patriarchy, and this is something you guys need to remember, patriarchy does not mean bad man chains you to stove and forces you to give birth, right? Patriarchy doesn't mean your husband gets to beat you and it's legal and everybody cheers him on while he beats you with a sack of potatoes. That's not patriarchy. Patriarchy is you have virtuous men who through merit, through uh, wisdom, discernment, courage, and masculinity in the proper context, run society for the betterment of everyone. You need patriarchs to have a healthy patriarchy. But what happens when feminism takes over is you destroy patriarchs. You, you, you basically outlaw them. You, mm -hmm. you push them to the edges of society and make them the weird thing. Guess who's going to rush in to fill in the gap? Guess what kind of men you're going to get? <laughs> right. If you turn patriarchy into something terrible, then you get simps, cheaters. You get Andrew Tate. You get Kanye West. You get these men that come in and fill the void with this false swag, this fake swagger. I don't know if y'all have seen Andrew Tate's rap video that he made a few years back. It is the most cringe thing I've ever no, I've seen. I've not seen that one yet. Oh, it just, if you want to know what a fake, phony, masculine guy he is, just go watch his stupid rap video he made a few years back when he still had hair. It's the most cringe thing you've ever seen. So you get this fake, uh, it's like, hey girl, what's up? I'm running drugs and I'm, I'm slinging cocaine and, you know, like... All the rap girls will rap about how they want a, a man who's gangsta and slings cocaine and all this stuff. Or guys look at girls, you know, the hot girls are running off with some uh, white trash dude who's like violent and has like, you know, prison tags yeah, on his face. The and they're, they're like, why? They're like, why? Why would she do that? Well, because we told her that patriarchy is stupid and awful and terrible and that those guys are the bad guys, yeah. right? And so now the only masculinity there is are criminals and wannabes and phony, phony masculine pickup artist types and stuff like that. So what happens if you destroy yeah. real patriarchs, you end up with these people being the high status men because they're ruthless and they'll do whatever it takes. Right. right. And Tristan Haggard, uh, eventually we plan on doing a stream on. Um, what I, what I reached out to him about is sort of three examples of this exaggerated form of masculinity in the contemporary period. One would be liver King. And so he yes. just got exposed for lying about, again, if you wouldn't take steroids, take steroids, but he right. made an entire brand claiming that his physique was due to eating raw meats and these primal ancestral tenets. And so liver King is the perfect example of the sort of exaggerated form of like masculinity, primitivity, and traditionalism, right? It's all about the ancestors and doing things the way our ancestors did. And look how much of a man I am. And then you yeah. have Andrew Tate, which is a, a different exaggerated form of masculinity of the wealth, of the access to women, the access to social status. Um, and this is a, another exaggerated form. And then you have like Aubrey Marcus, 
um, yes. of of on it. And this is another exaggerated form of worshiping the woman and the goddess. And that again, really, it's an it's a re elevation of himself because he he gets to give the acceptance of the woman. I get to recognize you as the goddess, but then you know, get down on your knees and virtue signal. And so all three of these are these examples of this sort of exaggerated form of masculinity in the contemporary period, where as Orthodox, in a way we embody all these things, but more, you know, in the center. So yes, we don't negate women. We, we're not, uh, you know, against women. We believe the Theotokos is the highest of, of, you know, having full human nature. We aren't against um, success. We aren't against making money and being able to have families, uh, Andrew Tate would be then a radical example of, of that going too far. We're not against tradition and doing what our ancestors do, but that right. means then submitting to the church, not liver king and becoming, a you know, making hundreds of millions of dollars by lying about yourself and actually having a premeditated agenda to get on steroids and get the physique and then tell everybody to buy your supplements. And so right. all of these are sort of these exaggerated forms of masculinity that we see in the world. And a true man has to follow God, and by following God, naturally he'll acquire his masculinity because he's going to then maintain boundaries, have purpose, have meaning, and move in a certain way in the world and, and towards a particular direction, too, towards God, towards tradition, towards what is true, good, and beautiful. And so um, I think the only way out is traditional masculinity, but one of the things, and this will be another stream I'm kind of ranting now, but another stream <laughs> in the future I want to talk about Islam. Because yes. I think Islam is naturally going to acquire a lot of young Western men. Because yes, um, I do too. Not that I think Islam is a correct worldview. Obviously, I'm Orthodox, but um, Islam, in its um, in its uh, appearance and the way that it, the way that women submit and the way that it sort of structures its society, is very appealing for young men who are disenfranchised in the West due to everything we're talking about—the cat lady the feminized women, the sexual promiscuity. Well, I might yeah. as well just become Muslim as a Westerner. Now I can go to Mecca. Now I can go to the Middle East. Now I can go and get access to these beautiful Muslim women yes. who are virgins and who are, are pure. But at the same time, it's not the pursuit of God and what is true. If you pursue what is true, eventually you're going to get the orthodoxy, which then allows right. you to keep all that stuff. It allows you to yeah. still pursue the young, beautiful, uh, pure girl. But it also is a true theology. It actually is reality. And Islam has always been a sort of uh, deformed version of Christianity. And it's always been a way that's dominated through the sword. And I don't think it's something that is ultimately true doesn't have to cut somebody's head off to maintain its validity. Right. Um, and that's the difference between orthodoxy and Islam. And I think that over time, I, I suspect, you know, moving throughout this decade, Islam is going to radically grow in prominence in the Western world. We already see in Western Europe as the fastest growing religion. Yep. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because I was ranting a little bit to Andy about that two days ago because I posted something to Twitter. Um, like Andrew Tate's lawyer is now saying that his whole online persona is a fake character. This is part of his defense. And I had been telling people, hey, this guy is a phony. He's not really like masculine. And so what happens when I say that as a woman is, OK, you're just like every other feminist. You're going to sit here and tell us what a real man is. And I'm like, no, I just know grifters by this point because I'm, I'm your mama's age. These are always 20 year old guys that say this to me. And I'm like, I'm your mother's age and I've been around a long time. And I know phony grifters when I see them. And he's not, he doesn't want to help you get chicks. He wants to take your money. Right. He wants you to buy Hustlers University. Right. He's not trying to help you. And he doesn't care about you. When he was in the UK, he was atheist. When he lived in Romania, he was Orthodox. Yeah. And then when he moved to Dubai, he became Muslim. Right. Okay. And now he's telling everybody he's converting to Islam so he can have his harem. And these young guys were like completely agreeing. And they were like, yeah. Because then we don't have to wait for these horrible Western women to submit to us because they're never going to. We'll get the harem we deserve. And I was like, the, like Jay's wife, Jamie Hanshaw, and I had done a show where she said a lot like, yes, there's definitely a problem with the women. But the problem with the men is we've got 25 year old men who live at home with mom and mom's still baking them chicken tendies at night. 
and tucking them in with their chalky milk. And they believe that they like deserve a harem because they were born with a penis. Right. And she was saying, you don't just deserve a wife. And my husband would be the first to tell you. In fact, he said this when we were visiting Zen Shapiro this weekend. He said, I get the big piece of chicken because I'm the guy that solves everyone's problems. I have to handle every crisis. If something goes, if something breaks, I got to fix it. If something needs to get paid, I got to find a way to pay for it. Right. If, if anything happens, I'm the guy, right? The buck stops with me. I have the ultimate responsibility and I'm in charge of taking care of the whole world's problems. So yes, I get the big piece of chicken at dinner. That's my big reward. You know, like he was kind of joking, but he was just saying like, yeah, I get the respect because I have massive amounts of responsibility and I come through on that. Right. right. This is what everybody forgets. And this is what people don't understand. Patriarchy is great. It's good to be king, but you also have the maximum responsibility. Men who are patriarchs of families, patriarchs of communities, men who are in charge have the most responsibility and they are expected to perhaps even give their life for their family or their community or their nation. And this is another reason why like transnational elites want to get rid of the patriarchy and families because Who's going to be there to defend communities or nation states if we rip the man out of the family? Nobody, right? So then the nations are ripe for the for the picking and we can have this globalism and whatever that they want. So it all goes together. It's all part of a bigger system from a micro scale to a macro scale. And when you take away virtuous masculinity, there's nothing to defend the good, the beautiful or the true anymore. And that's, and then you end up with crazy cat lady society. So that's exactly it. That's exactly it. Um, is there anything else you want to mention before wrapping up? We got some super chats to dive into, but uh, we hit everything that I wanted to dive into. And uh, it's been really, really wonderful. Uh, a bit of a whirlwind for many of the uh, listeners, <laughs> but that's the way that we do it, right? It's, yeah. it's a lot of information coming We get into a flow and fast. we just go. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm happy to, you know, take super chats in case, you know, cause we, we tend to talk a lot and spit a lot of facts and things. So if anybody wants clarification or has questions, that'd be great. All right. Well guys, please smash that like for everybody here still here. I truly appreciate everybody who's sending super chats. We're going to go through all of them uh, real quick. Um, again, shout out to the Zen Shapiro. Congratulations, brother. Uh, welcome home to you and your family. Uh, beautiful family. Uh, really, really happy to hear that you have become uh, Orthodox and God bless you. I uh, wish you nothing but the best. Yeah, he's a he's a great example of somebody who had to come from this modern world and figure this stuff out. He and his wife. And they did, and they're doing it right now in real time. So we know it's possible. Like they found their way and they came from, you know, being kind of lost in the atheist ethos a little bit, not really knowing like what, you know, like trying to find a way in life and through honest searching for the truth and then prayer and, and these sort of things found the true path and they're on it at a young age with a new baby. So that's super amazing. And it gives us all hope. So Amen. love them. First super chat comes from our wonderful doctor. Dr. Vagisil throws in $1 and he says, thank you, DPH and Dr. Rachel of Glad Tidings. We should include these childless cat ladies in our prayers, even though their existence directly benefits my practice. They have untapped femininity to make the world a better place. Uh, Absolutely. Absolutely, Dr. Vagisil. I think we should always keep uh, everybody in our prayers, uh, including Andrew Tates and Liver Kings and everybody else of the world. Uh, um, we should be praying for everybody that we're concerned with and even our enemies and even the threats that be. So uh, great comment. Uh, truly appreciate that, Dr. Vagisil. Next super chat comes from our sister, Amp Town One. Throws in $10. No comment. Shout out to Amp Town One. Uh, uh, hoping you come back to church here, uh, Amp Town One. She actually is uh, lives in the vicinity and came to uh, my parish. She didn't stay for fellowship, so next time, stay. We got to have coffee and chit chat. Yeah, don't be shy. Everybody's shy. <laughs> don't, don't be, be shy. shy. We Patrick don't bite. won't bite. He's really nice. 
Uh, <laughs> so thanks again, Amp Town One. God bless you and your family. Hope everything is well. Uh, thank you for the $10 super chat. Next one comes from Dr. Vagisil, throws in $3. And says, when men collectively show women the joy they get from serving slash following God, then women will start to trust men to lead them. True. True. One of the hardest things is rejecting women's sexual advances before marriage because we are fighting our testosterone. True. Yeah, I think that, um, you know... One of the big problems, and even there is a guy here in the chat, I just I just uh, banned him from being able to comment. I can't believe every time we talk about women being accountable, we have to talk about men. This is a weak mentality, and I really don't have time for men who can't deal with criticism of men, uh, especially a man who identifies as an incel. Um, I understand that things aren't the way that they historically have been. Um, that means that God's providence has chosen for you to exist at this point in time in history because you dealing with the situation that exists is part of your salvation. And whether you become a monk, that's one thing. If you don't want to become a monk, then you need to better yourself. And that means being able to hear a little bit of criticism about men. That's pathetic. And so men um, absolutely need to become better. Um, I think that's that's the biggest thing. If If men... Uh, became the traditional archetype of a Christian man, there are going to be women who are going to follow and be with those men. They may not be virgins. They may have made mistakes, but it's all providence. Your providence mm -hmm. is going to occur. And this is one of the things I have to say that I am in a very happy relationship. And, um, you know, this gets back to the balance that I've worked on myself and continue to work on myself for the last three years. And I like to think that I'm in a different place than I was. And I see now in the relationship that I have the, the matching, the balancing of the man that I've worked on to develop allows the space for the woman that I wanted to be with and allows yes. her then to feel comfortable to be that feminine woman because of the, the person I've worked on to become. And so it's always a both relationship. And so men, it's, it's not, you shouldn't be worried about the criticism. You should be thrilled that, that you get to change the situation. That if we want to change the way that the world is and the way women are, if we become better men, we become more masculine men, and we follow God, God will sort the rest out. We don't have to worry about it. You don't have to change every woman. And if you're no. still heartbroken about the liberal woman that you had a, a year-long fling with in your, you know, your mid-20s, dude, grow up. Like you're, you're still a child. You need to become a man if you want a woman. If you want a little girl who's going to you know, play Instagram games, then, then stay who you are. So... I, if you are afraid of male criticism, then you come to the wrong channel because I believe the whole thing begins with men. I only bring women on to talk about women because I don't do streams just to bash women uh, right. because it's really all about men. The women are the way they are because men allow the society to erode to, to the point that it is. Yep. And I, everybody knows I give women the criticism because of exactly what you said. I'm specifically in a unique position to do that where some women might listen to me whereas if you or andrew or any other man just said the things i say even if they were right the women are just going to go that's misogyny he's a misogynist and they won't listen whereas for some reason when i say it and i'm honest about our shortcomings as women it tends to have more an effect but it is true that the reason the sexual revolution happened at all we was because men went oh well, she'll sleep with me and I don't have to commit or anything. Sounds like a good deal to me. And I tell men all the time now, I'm like, looking back, wasn't a good deal for you guys really at all. So <clears throat> yeah, it's not just women. Obviously men are the leaders. And Andy always says, if we all stood up tomorrow and put a stop to it, it would end. It ends. That would be it. It ends. That's the problem. That's why uh, you can be frustrated with the women, no <clears> doubt. <throat> And that's why we did the stream talking about, you know, literally half of the American population is going to be single and childless. And those are women that you're not going to be able to marry. So those are right. suitors that aren't going to be good mothers. Um, so as men, the market, the sexual marketplace is is dwindling uh, quite significantly to the potential mates. But again, if you're a Christian man, that's not your responsibility. If you do the things that you need to do and work on yourself, God brings that person into your life. It's not something you have to do. And that's that's something that has happened in my, my life more recently where it's not something I have to force. It literally is so organic and natural that it's providence. And, and that's what yep. you want. And so um, men, it's a free, it's a liberating feeling. 
oh my gosh, all I have to do is focus on God, my life, and becoming the best man that I I can be, and uh, and God, if it's my province, will provide me with the perfect woman that compliments me, and, and I'm going to be responsible for our salvation, and we're going to be tied together. That's exactly what's going to happen if you decide to go yes. on that journey, but it's not easy. It's not like uh, sign up for Islam and you get your harem because you have two balls and a dick. That's not how it right. works. <laughs> exactly right, Patrick. So next super chat comes from Dr. Vagisil again for $1 and says women experience life through emotions and Satan uses sissy male actors in Hollywood to hit all their buttons and tell them to do thou wilt. The Theotokos is the example women need to break the chains of the flesh and pride, generous in grace, meek in exaltation. Ooh, great comment, Dr. Vagisil. Hundred percent. His name, Dr. Vagisil, is misleading. He does he does throw in some real some real poetry sometimes with these comments. Yeah, that was a good one. That was 100% a good one. Hundred percent agree. That was a good one, and it's true. The the that was another thing we didn't even get into that I wanted to mention, but I didn't write down was the birth control affecting the hormones and and women actually um, actually affecting the way that they choose men. And so they will literally choose more effeminate men because the way that their hormones are affected, they're more averse to a higher testosterone man where when they get off those things and this, I've heard multiple women, not that I've dated them, but just women talking about getting off birth control mm -hmm. that they notice after a month or two months that they were became much more attracted to traditionally masculine men. And because that's the way it all, that's the way it's supposed to work. And so again, the sterility of, of birth control itself is an entire wrench into the, you know, the, the system of, of sexual relations within our society. Yeah. And if you guys want to hear more about that, we did a mother's day stream that we talked a lot about the Theotokos and we talked about birth control and motherhood. We got into a lot of those things. So I didn't want to like, if you let me talk about the Theotokos, I could go on for hours and hours and hours. So, um, but we did do that more if you're interested in like our takes on her. And I think we went over things like birth control and a lot of that kind of stuff in the Mother's Day stream that you and I did mm -hmm. together. Yeah, that was that. We've done a lot of great streams. And then the last one we did was on horrific, looking yeah. at basically looking at the witch as an archetype. Um, and then before that, we did one on your book on uh, yeah. the history of feminism. So, uh, this is our, our fourth stream together, I believe, and they've all been phenomenal. So, uh, yeah, we'll have to do another one. Uh, uh, who knows what the topic is, but I'm sure it's going to be great, uh, as they always are. Uh, next Super Chat comes from Brooke M. Throws in $10 and says, thanks for all your work, Rachel. I love your book! Exclamation mark. Thank you, Brooke. I love hearing that. I, when I wrote that book, I had no idea if anyone was ever going to read it. So whenever somebody tells me they love it, I'm super happy. So thank you. Yeah. Uh, it's amazing the impact that you've had. How, how was, uh, how's that been, you know, from, uh, central Twitter anonymity as based homeschool mom to author. And now, uh, you know, or, or is it, is it any different or is it, is it different? I mean, uh, so, um, what it kind thoughts? of is like, um, I will actually be starting my own show. I haven't said anything about it, but the 26th is going to be my very first live stream of my own show. And I always said I wasn't going to do one, but I've gotten so many like specific requests of women asking for help, wanting mentorship. And I'm, I would never have time to do one-on-one -on -one stuff. Uh, and I feel like I could help the greatest number of people by doing live streams. So I'm going to talk a lot about this kind of stuff, motherhood, homeschooling, marriage things, uh, feminism stuff, deprogramming, all of that. And then a little bit of my other work that I do about like crypto history and things like that as well. So we're going to start that the 26th. But um, after I did Tucker Carlson last winter, I got home and there was a quarter of a million comments under that stream already by the time I got home from the studio. Wow. Um, where they had posted it on Fox's YouTube channel. There was oh, yeah. 450,000 comments of all of these people saying that they always wanted to homeschool or they wanted to stay home with their kids because that's what I was there to talk about was homeschooling and, and how more moms, like there's a silver lining in this COVID pandemic stuff because so many more people can work remotely and do homeschool. And there's just this opportunity for us. 
to be at home and have a more family centric life and homeschool and things like that, get our kids out of the system. Right. And just a quarter of a million people saying, wow, I think I'm going to actually try this. I'd always wanted to, but I didn't want to be the weird one. And I just needed to hear somebody say that I could do it. And I just started to cry. <laughs> I just sat there and just cried because for, for 20 years now, I've been the weird one, right? I've been the person trying to swim upstream against the culture, right. raise my kids the way that I think they should be raised, uh, live my married life the way I think it should be lived with everyone around me telling me I'm wrong. Everybody around me telling me I'm crazy, I'm wrong, it's too risky, I'm going to regret it. Uh, I, you know, My kids won't be socialized. They'll turn out to be weird. Andrew's going to leave me for a younger woman. All the, oh my, all the comments for 20 years. Because you're going to homeschool? Oh, it, because I'm a submissive wife and oh I don't have my own my own career and I don't have my own everything. So oh it's God. just a matter of time before he just leaves me high and dry and then I'll be screwed and I'll regret it. And oh, that's 99 percent of the things I've ever heard about the way I've chosen to live my life have been very negative and very discouraging. And I always felt like really alone and really like I was swimming against the current. But I was like, you know what? I just prayed for courage and strength to do it anyway. And so me talking about it, now there's like these thousands of people saying, hey, I want to do that too. And all I really needed to hear was somebody tell me, hey, that's okay. It's cool. You can do it. You know, you can homeschool your kids. You can submit to your husband. It's you're going to be fine. It's not terrible. You're not stupid for doing those things. Right. And just seeing all those comments, I just sat there and like cried. Cause I was just so happy. So I like the impact has been really good. It's been, it's felt really good to kind of feel like um, I'm just the little bit of encouragement that maybe people need to give it a shot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's, like, it's been really positive. And as you mentioned, 2020 has been such a catalyst for many people in the right way. God uses all negatives for positives. If you are moving in the right direction. And so, yeah. um, you know, I, as I said before, I think 2020 has been a great impetus for people to get more serious about their religious lives, to get more serious yeah. about their physical health, to get more serious about their relationships. And so now it's like if you're looking for a traditional relationship, the the demarcations between a woman you should avoid and a woman you should choose are never been more clear. And so right. it's like maybe 15 <laughs> years ago, you'd probably make the wrong choice. Now, if you have eyes to see the dating market, it's way more clear in regards to choosing a mother for your family, for your progeny, for your lineage. And so something that we don't talk about is, you know, we need to teach women how to choose better. And if I bet families were more involved in mating decisions, yes. we would make, they would make a lot better choices. But, you know, the woman who maybe made the wrong choice got married and the guy did, you know, leave her high and dry on the few chances that that actually happened. Well, lady, you, you chose, I mean, like how involved was your father in the mate decision? Right. How involved was your mother in meeting him? How, invo how involved, whatever the type of conversations you had about the future and the plans and what your yeah. 5, 10, 15, 20 year plans, where are you going to go? It's like, there's a lot of ways we can avoid these by just becoming better at mate selection based on a biblical worldview. I think that would help a lot of people. Oh yeah. When my 96 year old grandma was choosing which guy to marry in 1945, she told me that back then the, the way they chose was like, What's his family like? Does he go to church? Does he go to a church that I want to go to? Like, do we have the same religious beliefs? Do we want to raise our kids the same? Can he provide for a family or not? Right. Um, do I like my in-laws? It was like these kind of things. It wasn't just like, is he cute and funny? You know, <laughs> so it's, it's so different now. Now that everything is just based on like attraction. And then you'll hear these ridiculous platitudes of like, he has to love you for you or right. some nonsense like that. And it's like, no, no, no. This is like the, it, you would never sign a contract to like start a business or start a job or uh, purchase a home without going over every little detail and making sure that you understand the implications right. and, and what, you know, all these sort of things. But marriage people just seem to think it's like, it just feels right. right. And it's like, it should be way more than that, yeah. you know. Getting getting married out of the sort of an infatuation phase uh, isn't yeah. a smart decision. You need to think long term, no. and that's another problem with Western men: 
is generally speaking, I would say all the ones, again, that are orthodox maybe may not fall, but generally speaking, they don't think long term. And so, and that's when we've been conditioned this way over the last two generations, where historically that wasn't the point because we had our grandfathers, our fathers, and uh, all the cousins around us. So we saw generations around us all the time. Now yeah. grandparents are in a nursing home, as you said, being being helped by people who don't speak English and don't know them for minimum wage. Our parents are retired and they're on the beaches of Florida or something. And then and then we have student loan debt and, you know, the girls having promiscuous sex in her apartment and works for Twitter or something. Who knows? I know it's such a mess. <laughs> it's just such a mess. But we're trying. We're trying we're our trying. best. Just bring it all home. You know, just family, family, family. Next yes. super chat comes from Dr. Vagisil, throws in $3 and says, Lib women think birth control is magic pill when it really makes them get pumped and dumped <laughs> and choose a feminine man. Yep, we said that because it messes with their hormones. And when they get yeah. off, they want a masculine man, but don't have an example of a good man to pursue. Exactly. We were hitting on this, but this is another great point by Dr. Vagisil is, um, you know, how would a woman even off hormones, how would she find and choose a traditional man? And that's where, well, if you want a traditional man or a masculine man, you're going to have to be within a tradition. And so you're not going to find a secular uh, man who's going to have all these real masculine traditional characteristics because that's not where they come from. So yeah. you're going to have to find, maybe he's Protestant or Catholic or Muslim or whatever. I mean, I'm not advocating for that. I'm just saying that those men are going to have more traditional masculine values than the secular man who likes Marvel movies. Right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Next super chat comes from Wayne Murphy for one ninety nine. Says, "Does Matthew eighteen eighteen apply to marriage?" Uh, I'm not sure what Matthew eighteen eighteen is. Let me read that. Uh, Matthew eighteen. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be lost in heaven. Um. Yeah, I mean traditionally that is. A reference for the uh, binding ceremony of marriage, uh, Wayne Murphy. So yes, that does apply to marriage. Um, that's why divorce is seen as such a massive uh, sin and detriment to long-term relations. And as you're talking about, one of the things I didn't mention that I wanted to write down was how many times you reference women already planning for a divorce before the yep. marriage. And that yes. would be, for me as a man, like I'm very straightforward about what I'm looking for and what I expect. And also then what the other person expects of me, I want to have that conversation immediately, but divorce is, is not even on the table. I mean, that, that yeah. is not an option. If we move forward, it is not an option. We are going to die together. Even if we hate each other. Uh, we're not right. getting divorced. <laughs> right. I, I was having a conversation recently with a, like a baby boober generation woman about this sort of thing. And, you know, she was kind of asking me like, she, you know, she's like, I, I want to be with you on the stuff you say, but, but what about men? Like, what if they don't show up for me? What if they hurt me? What if, what if this, what if this, what? and I looked at her and I said, if you believe that about men, cause she even said, like, I was taught that we can't trust men to, to do all these things. You know, we can't plan our lives that men are going to do the right thing. And I looked at her and I said, then why would you ever marry one? Right. Because she had been married and been divorced and she kind of sat back and what didn't have anything to say. And you could kind of see the wheels turn. If you were taught that you can't trust men and you can't depend on them and it's just a terrible idea, it's not what a wise woman does, then why would you ever even consider marriage if you really believe that's true? Right. So either you don't really believe that's true or, you know, something, something there doesn't add up. And um, yeah, I, I tell people too, like, you can have a bad month in your marriage. You can have a bad year in your marriage. Now, Andrew and I have never gone that long, but we've had a few bad months where we were like not super fond of each other, but we always work it out, you know, and it's, that's been very rare. And that was more like early on. And the longer we've been together, the less and less that happens. And it's just like, now if we get mad at each other, it's like, you know, he'll be like, ah, you'll be you won't be mad at me 20 minutes from now. It's fine. Or, <laughs> or I'll say, 
I'll say, uh, all it, you're just one good meal away from settling down. It's fine. You know, and we just, we always work it out because we've already been through so much crap that it's like, there's, it would take something catastrophic at this point right. to ever. Well, you bring up a good point in regards to like compromise uh, when arguments arise. And so yeah. um, that was a red flag, even Orthodox girl I dated in the last three years just to, to court and see is the inability to compromise even, okay, has all the values, has a lot of the right things that we're talking about, but the inability to compromise when it comes to difference of opinions or different thoughts. And how I think that comes back to the narcissism and the self-absorption that all of us are, you know, even the men, we're all, we're all wrapped up in these problematic aspects of Western civilization. So we're all affected by it to some degree or another, just depends on the severity of the degree, but finding somebody who will compromise, who will say, sorry, sometimes when they don't even feel like they are wrong. Yep. I will, I want somebody I'm willing to do that. I want to be with somebody who's also willing to do that. That way it's not this competition where you start getting later into these mind games of, Oh no, they need to say sorry for us. They, and then it just becomes this escalating process. This isn't, this isn't the right mentality to have a relationship. This isn't the way people who really care about each other are going to act long term. And so, uh, finding somebody who will compromise is why then some of these 30 year old women, are still single, even though they're above exactly average it. in their beauty. Yeah, you're really pretty or you're better than average or you certainly had a lot of prospects, but you're 35, you're 38 now. I bet it's really hard for you to compromise. I bet men find you very difficult to be around and deal with whenever you're upset or you're not getting pleased the way that you right. want. Yep. And I that's if I have one piece of relationship advice that I would say is my best piece of relationship advice for women is that if you think you want a high status man, you think you want that alpha type, right? The guy who's got it all together. You can trust him to lead. He's going to be tall and strong and handsome and competent and courageous and virtuous. Then that kind of guy, you cannot step on his dick. Yeah. Okay. So you got to choose if you want to wear the, pants and you want to be the boss, then the only kind of guy who's going to put up with that is a weak beta bitch who you're not going to respect and you're not going to want to be with anyway. And if you want that, that dream guy that all the women say they want, then you have to understand it is absolutely not going to happen for you to step all over him, for you to try to walk all over him, for you to shit test him to see how much crap he'll put up with. So if you want that guy, the biggest barrier is going to be learning that you, you cannot do that. And if you catch yourself doing it, you need to go compose yourself. And this is something I learned years ago. If I'm getting in my feels and I'm getting an attitude with my husband, even if I really think I'm right, okay? Like I'm just, I'm, cause you guys know I debate and all this stuff too. So I can get there sometimes where I'm like, well, I know that it's this and I really think, I'll think I'm right. I will take myself in my bedroom. I will close the door. I'll give myself a minute to be mad. And then I get down on my knees and I pray because something about getting, changing your physical stature, right? You're submitting to God first. You're getting down on your knees to pray before your creator humbles you and brings you back to reality that no, you're still a sinner. You're still fallible. You're not perfect. You don't deserve to lord over your husband or anything like that. And that might even just hearing me say that might bring up feelings of but, 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 but in some of you ladies out there. But I'm telling you, if you want one of these really great guys, get used to being able to be humble and submit, even if you totally think you're right. Because guess what? If you are right, he's going to see that eventually anyway. He's going to trust your judgment. He's going to pay attention to the things you say, but you cannot have a high quality guy. If you're going to be constantly trying to step on his dick all the time and tell him what's what and, yeah. and cut him off and point out all his flaws and any of that. So you got to get those behaviors under control or you're never, you're always going to end up with a guy you got to take care of right. is the, what you'll the, get. The argumentative nature of some women, even if they have all the right values, yeah. And paradigm and see the world the right way. Uh, there's just characteristics and, and maybe some guys, I'm sure there's many characteristics of men that can, they can let go astray. Uh, but the argumentativeness, uh, just any traditional man isn't going to want to deal with that because right. he already has to argue with the world constantly and the state of the world as it is. If we are traditional Christians, 
uh, we need we need a teammate. We need somebody that's home yes. based that that is our piece that that you know we're shielded from the world. Yes, not, exactly. Not more arguments. Not more more problems. Not more tension when we when we come home. Yep, and that's exactly right. So if you don't get anything else out of this conversation, and you're a woman and you are hoping for a marriage, what Patrick just said and what I just said before that, please just take that to heart. And even if it feels really foreign and like weird to you at first, try it. It's just like anything else with practice, you get used to it and you realize, oh, this is not demeaning to me. Me being submissive is not demeaning. It does not mean that I'm lesser than or that I'm incompetent or anything like that. It really doesn't. But you've got to understand you've been programmed so hard to feel that way that it's going to take a little practice and it's going to feel a little foreign at first. So don't let that stop you. Yeah. Great point. Next super chat comes from Hosu Garza throws in $10 and says, so glad I got to watch this live. Been so busy lately. Hearing y'all talk about this makes me so thankful to God that he helped me find a very based traditional and beautiful woman who pushes and helps me to fulfill my God given role in this life. Yeah, that's that is the best is uh, the best. Is, is a woman who also pushes you. And, and that's where, you, you know, you don't want a woman who's just a Passover, who who has no opinions and has no constructive criticism, because, you know, I know I'm fallible and I know I mess up and I know sometimes I'm I lack emotional sensitivity and things that I do. So uh, somebody who can be there and, and recognize those things, but speak to me in not an argumentative way, but a constructive, helpful way and pushes right. you to be a better version. That's what we all want. Yes. And that's what your partner should be doing is it's a it's a growing together. It's a pushing together and it's an agreement that, um, you know, forward at all costs. Yep, exactly. Next super chat comes from Pim Orsos throws in twenty dollars. Shout out to our main man. Pim says Barbie 2023 thoughts. Oh, the movie, I think he's talking about. Oh, I there's don't know. A Barbie That's what, I was movie. hoping you knew because I didn't know what he referenced by oh, Barbie 20. Yeah, there's some kind of I've only seen me, like tiny clips, so I don't really know. But it looks it looks like it's going to be a lampoon of traditional femininity to me because they make Barbie so incredibly exaggerated that she looks kind of ridiculous. So I I don't know. I've only seen tiny, tiny snippets of it, but. Oh, Margaret, Mar Margaret Robbie, Mar Margot Margaret Robbie, Robbie is the is Barbie and Ryan Gosling is Ken. Yeah, that's right. It's where they like CGI them and make them look really like plastic, exaggerated versions of themselves. So I was just just based on the tiny snippet I saw, it kind of looked like hmm. that to me. Like they're gonna make it some kind of feminist garbage because that's what they do with everything. Yeah, I have not been aware. I have not looked into this. Um, I'm I'm watching the trailer muted right now on IMDb and it looks almost like apocalyptic. I mean, it shows little girls in a desert playing with Barbies. Um, I I don't know. So we'll have I, to look into that one. Yeah, maybe we'll have to do a stream. When does that come out? Let me see when that comes. out. That'd be another great stream topic. Is we could decon July twenty first, twenty twenty three. So not till this okay, summer, but summer. I'm sure we'll do a few streams before that. But we should mark that on the calendar. We should definitely do a review of Barbie twenty twenty three. Yeah, we should. <laughs> we'll have Base Lit come on too. All three of us. Will yeah, talk to Barbie wouldn't that be great? Yeah, that'd, that'd be, be awesome. Fun. Uh, he can he can tell us how uh, this is all just a play off Hamlet and Shakespeare. <laughs> <laughs> I love that well, guy. Shout out he's to my Lit. We love you, brother. Um, oh, he's gonna. He and Jerry are gonna help me on my very first stream. Oh, they we are. We are gonna do. We're gonna do a breakdown of Team America: World Police. Do you remember that movie? Oh yes. With the puppets. Yeah, yeah. Like the South Park guys did it because. Um, it has so much to do with the current war propaganda that's been going on. It's this, it's almost the same type of narrative. And now if you go back and look at that, it's hilarious because it's 20 years later and you can see all the things in it that you probably would have never seen if you were watching it in 2003. And it's pretty hilarious, but it's also like they're literally using the exact same propaganda to push the current thing. So wow. we're going to, we're going to do a breakdown of that one. And then we'll get into some feminism stuff on the second one. So. Oh, that's great. Well, shout out to yeah. Jerry. Shout out to Bass. I see he's in the chat. Shout out to Dangerfield Henley. God bless you, brother. 
Uh, love you and God bless the family. Hope everybody's doing well. Well, that's great. Uh, we'll all be looking forward to, you say January 26th. 26th. Yeah, yep. January 26th. Well, that's awesome. Everybody mark it down. Have you already created the YouTube channel? Uh, Rachel? There you oh, are. Oh, there you are. Yep. You froze for a second. Did you already create the YouTube channel? No. Well, I have a YouTube channel that for some reason I just use it to comment. <laughs> And it's got like 330 subscribers already. Well, just so I'll probably that. just use that one. That's a great start already. The, I know, the hardest like it, is the first like thousand to two thousand subs. Yeah. And once you get I an see, audience, I'm, it grows. I'm benefiting from the patriarchy because I've been on your show and I've been on the crucible and I've been on modern day debate and I've been on Jerry's channel and like all these uh, wonderful guys channels. So uh, I get to like snipe a little bit of your audiences right from the start. So I get an unfair advantage. So thanks guys. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, you've given, you've received the permission from the patriarchy. So yes. patriarchally approved. As I always tell people on Twitter, I have my husband's written permission to be on the internet <laughs> because they'll say, if you're not, if you're not a feminist, why are you online talking? And I say, I have written permission from my husband to be on the internet. <laughs> I, I need to invest in that. Good thinking. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. That's great. That's hilarious. Um, next super chat comes from Dr. Vagisil again. Wow. Very, very, uh, loquacious on today's stream. Dr. Vagisil throws in $5 and says, uh, Dr. Rachel, would you say that the main weak points the devil attacks young women are lack of safety around men slash need of validation and emotional stimulation slash cat child replacement slash focus on sex life instead of understanding God's love slash earthly things versus heaven. So, let me just reread those real quick so you can grab all of them. Um, what are the weak points the devil attacks young women by? Because it would be all these. So maybe which one the most, we'll say. Um, uh, safety around men. The need for validation. Um, fur babies. Uh, and then the focus on uh, sex life. Or just earthly things versus transcendental heavenly things? Yeah. Well, all of those. Yeah, all of them. Um, but I always tell people, like, if you don't understand women, and again, I'm going to be in trouble for saying this, but it's true, okay? I'm just going to say the stuff that's true. Women's main currency is attention. All women, every woman, all women everywhere. Some kind of attention. That might be a little bit different depending on the woman, right? Right. Maybe not all women are like extroverted and want to be on a camera talking to people, but they want some kind of validation in the form of attention. Mm -hmm. What usually from a man, right? But um, sometimes it's just like social validation in general. It might be likes on Instagram, stuff like that. But most women want attention, which is why men who ignore them are the only ones they ever want. Do you ever notice that? Right. Do you ever notice like a good looking woman, the guy she chases after is the guy who's like, eh, I could take you or leave you. And then the dudes who simp for her, she's like Ugh, repulsed by and not interested in and she friend zones them. Right. So attention is a big currency for women. And uh, you can't give them too much because then your currency becomes invaluable, right? It's like inflation. If you're giving a, a woman just tons and tons and tons of attention, she thinks your attention is not valuable. Um, if your attention is hard to get in, in high demand, that makes it valuable. So that's kind of like how currency for women works as far as attention goes. And I think um, what the devil uses to trick us is he exploits our motherly instincts, um, which is so easy, especially having grown up in the 20th century with Disney movies and cartoons where all of the animals are anthropomorphized and they have big, big doe eyes and, and eyelashes and very emotive faces, just like a baby would. Um, and so that's why I think fur babies are this thing. It's like, Oh, I can have like the companionship and the cuddle waddles and the, Oh my God, isn't it cute? And all like those feelings without having like this, permanent responsibility for the development of another human being right which is very daunting and serious and it's 
a big deal, right? right? So it's like, everybody wants to uh, stay kind of infantilized and not have the real adult responsibility because that stuff's really hard. And people are scared because most of us now we're like three, four generations deep into this feminist ethos. Now where everyone's parents were divorced. All my kids, friends, parents are divorced except one, you know? And so I think people have a, a true lack of faith in the institution of marriage. Women and men don't trust each other. We don't trust our own parents because our parents screwed up and did a bunch of stuff wrong. And we're like, well, we can't go to them for advice because they screwed up. Um, so I think that the devil just uses like fear exploits our natural motherly instincts and our need for, we do need protection. I'm sorry. I'm like, I'm a tough girl. Okay. I'm strong. I shoot guns. Like I, I'm pretty tough for a girl, but I still need protection. I still don't want to be like off out in the world on my own with no one. Right. Uh, I love having my husband in the house and we have had a home invasion and he was the guy who went to the door with the gun we had people in our basement who broke in through our slider door and he had to go to the top of the stairs and pump a shotgun. And it did luckily scare them out. And then we had to call the police, but he was the guy who had to go to the top of the steps with the shotgun. They could have shot him in the face. Right. But he's the guy who goes and does that. It's not me. Um, and that's why he gets the big piece of chicken. That's right. But <laughs> that's, I, I think those things are what the devil exploits to trick us and convince us that family and motherhood is the dangerous thing. This is another reason why the antinatalists are constantly telling women that childbirth is going to ruin your body. You could totally die. They make it sound like everyone yeah. died in childbirth until, you know, 10 years ago or something, which is also not true. Yes, it happened, of course. But it's not nearly as... It wasn't a norm. It wasn't like the, no. the normal thing. Women died when they gave birth. You think God created no. a structure in which every time a person was born, somebody had to die? Like, right. it, it happened. So, I there mean, are certainly complications. Sure. and that, But there's risk in everything, right. right? We don't tell people, don't drive a car. Do you know how many people die in car accidents? No. We don't tell people their career might. We just, people feel so justified in scaring the crap out of women about motherhood and marriage. But we don't operate that way when it comes to anything else. Right. So I think that the, the devil plays on our fear. Um, and our vulnerabilities as women and yeah, like attention, the way that we can just get attention from people hitting the dopamine button on Instagram. It's like, that's not been good. Yeah. That, that one in the birth control is going to have yeah. a, a societal ripple effect. That's going to last for a while. Um, I know. I mean, I mean, we're already now seeing the sort of later or the earlier stages, the consequence of the, of the pill. Um, yeah. But the ability to demand attention online and the um, the abstra the abstraction of it, the attention, right? If yeah. I'm with somebody, it's a one to one. They they see I'm giving them attention, but the abstraction of the attention is just by po making a post and getting handles to to like and comment. Um, yeah. This is part of the abstraction of everything in the world, uh, right? Social justice, love, you know, uh, your authority, right? Instead of being a, the authority being your husband who then is his authority is the Trinity. Uh, your authority is the corporation, which has a bureaucracy, which is faceless, which you don't, again, the abstraction of authority itself. Yeah. Well, that's why so many women, especially when they get to a certain age, turn into little HR representatives. <sighs> they all talk and act like human resources ladies. Have you ever noticed yes. that? Like, especially the single childless ones. Yes. Oh my gosh, they're all just and like a bunch a of little HR look ladies. They, they, sometimes they look similar. I don't mean to be rude or, or overly generalized, but, you know, there is a sort of, you know, single 40-year-old woman look that oh, yes. they have. There's a starter pack. It's the ugly shoes. Like, it's either the Crocs or the, like, strappy lesbian sandals <laughs> that all the hippie ladies wear. <laughs> Yes. And then it's like a Subaru and the like perm, the curly, shorter permed hair. And then like, um, like just the frumpy clothes and stuff. And then that like big, the bag that crosses over your body this way. It's like a starter. Bag. <laughs> I know it is a stereotype of it, but it's like, it's very true. And they all kind of like conform to this same look. You know? Yeah, they definitely conform to the same worldview, uh, same politics. But yeah, it, and that's the whole thing is is with the look. And I 
I don't mean to ramble on. I want to get through these, so I'm sorry to keep your keep you here. But um, how we find our individual individuation and individual identity in God, and yeah. so it's like as people try to find their identity in the world, they become more and more like each other by whatever they adopt in the world. So I like cats. I'm an Insta girl. I do this. And then you can pick that, and now they all sort of look the same, and and so it's like I'm, uh, you know, I'm a liberal goth girl, or I the purple hair chick with the, you know, with the cattle piercing. Mm -hmm. um, why do they all look the same? Well, it's like this phenomenon where they're like going out and choosing their identity in the world instead of like understanding their relationship with God and then developing their identity through difficult work. They can just, the commodification, they can just buy the Hot Topic t-shirt and then dye their hair and put the piercing in and they have their yeah. identity. Yeah, exactly. They have their group of friends. They have their social networks to belong to. They have their hashtags they're supposed to use. It's like the world is giving everybody these false identities. Yeah. Next super chat comes from Amp Town One, throws in $5, and she says, Rachel, you are so right on your points. By the way, hats off to Andrew for tolerating that jackhole shushing him last night. <laughs> what, what happened last night? I missed it. He was debating a libertarian on that self-defense video that was making the rounds of the guy who shot the bad guy in Texas. Mm-hmm. They, they were just debating self-defense and the libertarian guy kept going, shh, shh, to him. <laughs> yeah. Was, was, he, was it an interesting debate or was the libertarian? Uh, it it was? was, but it was like, it was like three people who vehemently agreed with the libertarian and then everybody else kind of agreed with Andrew. And then uh, another libertarian guy called in so it kind of became a dog pile but you know andy he's like go ahead dog pile me i'll still win you know so it it got very contentious but it was fine like it's a guy that andy knows um so well it was i'll be for everybody listening i'll be over on the crucible a week from today to discuss uh hegelianism with uh spirit man so uh that should be interesting Everyone's going to love it. It's going to be great. <laughs> um, next Super Chat comes from Dr. Vagisil again. My gosh, he's keeping the show afloat. He throws in $2 and says, Women's gentleness is more persuasive to a man than her scorn. That is absolutely a tr the fact. All the examples in Hollywood show the first one to brainwash as many non-vigilant -vil women as they can over time. I'll shut up now. No, Dr. Vagisil, keep on throwing the yeah, super chats in, bro. You don't have to shut up. Um, yeah, it's a great point. I mean, a woman is incredibly more, um, more uh, persuasive with her feminist, femin uh, femininity. I don't want to say feminist, but femininity and her sort of uh, gentle... A uh, touch, her feminine touch. Yeah, caressing, maybe putting her fingers in your hair. It's like, ah, oh, crap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my big, bad, tough guy, Marlboro smoking husband just absolutely loves a good, like, little hair. It gets hair every tangle man. or whatever. It's, it's... He turns into a little a sweetie pie, you know? <laughs> or, you know, like, if I make him food, that is something that he genuinely feels, like, very loved, that I would make him food instead of just, like, throw like pre-made crap at him or whatever so like little things like that that he would never do for himself seemed to be like a big deal to him which i didn't understand when we first got together but yeah he's like a simple guy he just likes the little things that i do for him more than anything so next super check comes from dat boy throws in one dollar and says my relationship over a year ended because she wanted to go to college for eight years get a career cap off at two kids and she all but rejected orthodoxy then most people were upset at me for ending the relationship i was seen as an oppressor um hmm well that boy my just reading your comment my uh, my immediate response is you must be pretty young that you ended a relationship over a year because she wanted to go to college. Uh, but I'm not, not saying about college is an indoctrination organization. I'm getting a PhD. I, I know. But my point is, it sounds like you're a young man. And it sounds like there's, um, you know, 
a lot better matches for who you want to be and who you're going to become. And so uh, I wouldn't be too concerned with how somebody views you as an oppressor one way or another. Um, I would say if it, if, if she, if you have an idea of where your life wants to go and you're working actively to build that and she is not in congruency with where you're trying to take your life, then you shouldn't be together anyways. And no matter how heartbroken you guys may have had the best yeah. times together, you may, that might be the best year of your life, but ultimately long-term as an Orthodox man, um, if it's not where you're going, you know, and if you're still in your twenties, then don't worry because as a man, you really don't get leverage until later in life anyway. So you don't even have yeah. a leverage in a relationship till you're probably in your thirties and you're already doing the thing that you've trained and skilled to become at doing. So, Yep. So don't rush it. Uh, I, I'm sorry to hear that your, in, your relationship ended. And I apologize if I misconstrued or misunderstood anything within your comment. I'm just take, going based on what you said. Um, and yeah, so if she wants to have a career and, do all this, and she may change later too. So maybe she will be the right person in the future. Pray for her and pray that God will bring in the right person and do everything in your capability to work on yourself. And that's, that's going to be your best way forward. Also, one thing I would add is that shows, I think, some good wisdom on his part, because the most important thing you men will ever do is choose a mother for your kids. Yep. You're choosing not just your future, you're choosing your children's future. And if you know that this is a woman who is more invested in career than motherhood, and uh, just want, I'm not saying don't ever marry a college educated woman, but the incidence of the woman initiating the divorce in the couple goes up to 90% among college educated women. Yeah. It's a rough gamble. So, I mean, I think that was uh, probably a wise decision, at least for now on his yeah. part, if he's looking for a mother for his kids. So, yeah. I mean, based on everything you said, I think he did make the right decision. Um, you know, I know how breaking up relationship, especially if he's young and this was a high school sweetheart or he's in his early 20s and maybe this was the first real relationship and they were together for a year. You know, relationships are hard for men, especially a young woman. is. She may be heartbroken, but she's going to have a lot more opportunities right after than a young man. And so usually it's great fuel to go to the gym and yeah. <laughs> build a body. Uh, almost everybody I know who has a great physique has had his heart broken. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, so wherever you're at, uh, dat boy, not sure again, your situation. I appreciate the $1 super chat. Um, you know, sounds like you definitely made the right decision. Don't look back, only look forward, pray, work on yourself. And I guarantee you. God's providence will guide you in the right place and you will be with the right person who's aiding your providence, your goals and the salvation that you will hopefully attain together. Yes. Next super jack comes from Pim Orso. God bless you, bro. He throws in another $10. No comment. No comment. Well, thank you so much. Pim Orso. God bless you, brother. Uh, next one comes from, uh, Talita Dudley throws in $10 New Zealand. Thank you so much. Um, Talita, I'm sorry if I'm saying that wrong. Uh, Talita, thank you very, very much for the support. I see you in the live chat. God bless you, sister. And I appreciate the $10 super chat. Next one comes from Levi Holland, throws in $5 and says, men provide the correct traditional slash slave slash safe slash communal slash masculine leader environment for a woman and her traditional side will start to bloom. Um, and I agree with that, but not every man is those things. Uh, to be the correct, traditional, safe, masculine leader, you got to develop those qualities. Not everybody's born with, nobody's born with them. Uh, some are more gifted in certain areas than others. But uh, to be the man for her to be that traditional woman, you got to become that man. Um, so, uh, so Levi, uh, great point there. God bless you, brother. Thanks for the $5 super chat. And the last and final super chat comes from Amp Town One. And she throws in $2 and says, DPH is dating Mary Bailey. Um, and I would say I'm dating a very, very sweet girl that I'm very excited about and hopeful about. She's wonderful. Uh, glory to God. He's blessed me with our relationship. And she's referencing, I did a stream with Bayslit Analyzer on... Um, 
the uh, It's a Wonderful Life and his wife, Mary Bailey. Um, so I am town one. I did find my Mary Bailey and I actually found her before that stream. But um, uh, yes, I've been very blessed. God's been very, very good to me. But uh, thank you, Amp Town One, for the two dollars super chat, and thank you for always the uh, jovial and lighthearted comments. I do appreciate it. With that being said, that concludes all of our of our super chats, and it concludes our live stream. Rachel, thank you so much again for coming on and sharing your wisdom. Um, this has already been uh, almost three hours. It, again, I before we hopped on, Rachel and I were talking behind uh, <laughs> before we even started the stream. I was like, you know, who knows where we're gonna go. I'm sure it'll be probably an hour and a half, two hours. Well, we're already at two hours and 48 minutes, and it's been nonstop. It's been so much fun. Thank you again for coming on. God bless you and the family, you, Andrew, and all the girls. I truly appreciate you and Andrew's friendship. Uh, it's been really great. Love you guys, and thanks again for coming on. Well, thank you so much for having me back. I'm always super happy to come on anytime you want to do it. I think these streams that we do are... I think people really like them. You know what I mean? I get so much more feedback from doing streams with you than anyone else so far. Like I get a lot, a ton of people who say that they found me or found my book through the streams I've done with you. So wow. um, I think people enjoy them and I certainly enjoy them. And I you know that we well. love you very much. And, and we just think that you're fantastic. Love your channel. And Andy's like always trying to figure out ways that he can promote you if he can, because he, he really believes that what you do is so great and so important. So, um, and so do I, so thank you so much for having me back. Happy to come on anytime. And thank you to all the people who showed up and watched. You yes, guys are thank, great. Yeah. Special. Thank you to everyone. And, and also again, a thank you to Andrew. I know he's helped me with some stuff. Uh, and he's going to help me set up my uh, member stuff here on YouTube. I got to reach out to him with, uh, some stuff. So, Again, special thank you to Andrew and helping me out, brother. I really do appreciate it. And I will be over on the Crucible a week from tonight, as you heard, debating Hegelianism um, with uh, a gentleman named Spirit Man. So that should be a fun time. Rachel, thank you again. Anything you want to finish or say? Where can people reach you before we hop off here? What's the best oh. way to contact you? If you want to read some of my writing, you can go to rwilson.substack.com. Uh, my book is on Amazon. If you don't like Amazon, just find me on any of the social medias and I can get you a copy directly from me. I, I will be, I haven't said anything yet, but I will be on Jay Dyer's show Ooh. on the 25th. Whoa. Oh, the day before doing a little promotion. Huh? Yeah. Wow. Pulling yep. little Eastlab so, strings. I see. I know that's like, uh, that's a pretty big deal for me. Everybody knows that I love Jay's work and it has so much crossover with mine and uh, got a chance to meet him this summer when we were in Nashville and he's a really solid dude. And I love Jamie, his wife is I've gotten to know her pretty well and she's absolutely fantastic. So very, very blessed to be doing that. Super happy to be doing that. And then starting my own show, the 26th, it should be, uh, you'll see it. I'll post the links everywhere as soon as we get that up and going so i guess i'm an official e-girl now pray for me <laughs> <laughs> will do well thank you again for coming on and god bless everybody please hit that like and i will be back uh thursday with a stream that i'm really excited about called myth information and so we'll be playing off the phrase misinformation and talking about uh mythologies and it's in its construction and relationship to information acquirement and how really it's not so much about misinformation but it's about myth information which narrative structures we're adopting and believing in so i'll be doing that thursday evening i hope you guys are able to come back i will see you all then as always until